Good evening. I'm calling to order the meeting of the Arlington Select Board for Monday, August 9th, 2021. This is Select Board Chair Steve DeCourcy. Permit me to confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. Members, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Diane Mahan? Here. John Hurd? Yes. Len Diggins? Here. Eric Hellman? Yes. Staff, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Adam Chapelain? Here. Doug Heim? Here. And Board Administrator Ashley Meyer is participating remotely. Tonight's meeting of the Arlington Select Board is being conducted remotely, consistent with an act signed into law on June 16th, 2021, that extends certain COVID-19 measures adopted during the state of emergency. The act includes an extension until April 1, 2022 of the remote meeting provisions of Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 executive order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law. The governor's order, which you can find posted with agenda materials on the town's website for this meeting, allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. Before we begin, I'm going to offer a few notes. First, this meeting is being conducted via Zoom, is being recorded, and is also being simultaneously broadcast on ACMI. Persons wishing to join the meeting by Zoom may find information on how to do so on the town's website. Persons participating by Zoom are reminded that they may be visible to others and that if you wish to participate, you are asked to provide your full name in the interest of developing a record for the meeting. All participants are advised that people may be listening who do not provide comment and those persons are not required to identify themselves. Both Zoom participants and persons watching on ACMI can follow the posted agenda materials on the town's website using the Novus agenda platform. And finally, each vote tonight will be taken by roll call. We have a full agenda tonight, so let's see how much of the town's business we can get done. Before I do turn to the first agenda item, I do wanna note that for those of you viewing in expecting to see us in the select board chambers, with the change in the increase in the COVID transmission rates, the town issued an order earlier today um, through the town man through town manager chapter lane requiring face masks for all individuals in public buildings. The Board of Health will be meeting on Wednesday and I believe we'll be providing further guidance in light of that and, and other issues that come into play for a meeting that could last three to four hours. We thought it best to have the meeting remotely. We will continue to monitor um, things through our Board of Health and Health and Human Services. Um, I expect that our next meeting, Christine Bongiorno, our Director of Health and Human Services will be reporting to the board. She'll be meeting with the Board of Health on Wednesday. I believe she's meeting with the school committee on Thursday night. So um, before I start, uh, Mr. Chapdelaine, did you wanna add anything to, to that just on the announcement on the um, uh, for the face masks? I only to directly say this is in direct response to the Delta variant uh, and the surge underway in the nation, region, state, and even in Middlesex County. Uh, we are hoping, based on the science, we're saying that this will not be a long period of time, and we're going to be looking at this in very short increments of time. But as of today, as the chair mentioned, um, putting a mask requirement in place for public buildings, as well as a strongly encouraged um, uh, request of wearing masks in other public spaces has gone into effect. Great, okay, thank you. Um, so we will now turn to item two on the agenda, the Arlington Housing Authority tenant member appointment. I wanna provide just a little background before we ask the individuals who have um, submitted expressions of interest to present to the board. Um, back in December, along with the Housing Authority, we nominated or selected an individual, Fiorella Badilla, to fill an open seat on the Arlington Housing Authority. Following that appointment, the legislature enacted Chapter 358 of the Acts of 2020. That was signed into law on January 14th, 2021. That required that housing authorities have a tenant board member. Um, the date, the, the Act's effective date was May 15th. 
And following that act that superseded any other appointments that were made, that calls for a procedure to select, um, which is the select board's selection of a tenant member representative. The term of the appointment, and I'll turn to Attorney Heim, if, just for clarification on this, is through 2023. Um, that goes along with the um, period of time for the other members of the Housing Authority. So Attorney Heim, if there's, I just wanna clarify that that's the date that will be this term that we select and uh, if there's anything else you wanna add. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I just note that that term, the seat is for five years. However, we were three years into the seat that uh, was coming up for un under the legislation to have a tenant board member appointed. So the tenant seat is for five years, but we were three years into it due to the process and, and guidelines for how these things are supposed to be um, filled. And that was uh, confirmed with DHCD, uh, the town clerk, uh, housing authority member, uh, Julian Preston and uh, Jack Nagel, the uh, acting director of the housing authority while instrumental in making sure that that was clarified and confirmed. So again, we're making, a, you'll be making an appointment for uh, through 2023. Uh, it's after that, it will be a full five years the next time around. Uh, but, but there was three years that had already been occupied for for this specific seat. And for the public certification, the reason you wanna do that is you don't want multiple seats coming up in the same year. It's supposed to be on a rotating basis. Great. Thank you, Attorney Hines. And so we received eight um, individuals who either expressed an interest on their own or whose name was submitted through the clerk's office um, by the local tenant organizations, those being local tenant organizations at Winslow Towers and Cusack Terrace. We did not receive anything from Drake Village um, and we received five individuals from Monotomy Manor. So what I'm going to do, we didn't receive anything from Chestnut Manor either. What I am going to do is first read the names of the individuals who will be um, talking with us tonight, seeking the appointment. And then we will call each one individually, ask them to present for a minute or so I will ask board members if they have any questions for each of the candidates, and then we will move towards nominations and votes. So with that, I, I, the names of the individuals were posted on the agenda. Uh, Fiorella, and this is in alphabetical order, Fiorella Badilla, Dylan Dalton, Pat Dunleavy, Pamela Hauser, Alicia Jones, Cynthia McGinty, Julia Moden, Vanessa Russell. Um, Today we were notified that Alicia Jones has withdrawn from consideration. Um, and we were also notified that Ms. Dunleavy was, is unable to make it tonight. She did submit written materials for the board's consideration. And that is part of the agenda package. Um, one further correction, Cynthia McGinty is listed as Winslow Tower. She's actually Cusack Terrace uh, on the board's agenda. So with that, if we could go, uh, Mr. Chapdelaine or, or Ms. Meyer, if we could promote Ms. Adilla, and we will go in alphabetical order down the list. Hello. Good evening, Ms. Adilla. Hi, how are you? Good, how are you? Well, thank you. Good, good. Um, so if you could, we had received your written submission. Um, and if you could take about a minute or so and, and let us know why you're um, still interested in, in being the tenant housing representative, uh, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, my name is Fiorella Badilla and I live in Monotomy Manor at 60 Fremont Street. I am originally from San Jose, Costa Rica. Since last December, I have been honored to hold a position on the board of the Arlington Housing Authority, replacing Rick Murray, who uh, resigned. I have been an Arlington Housing Authority resident since I was 14. In the last eight months, I have learned a great deal about the duties a member of the board, which I can use to represent the interests of all housing authority tenants in the future. In addition to preparing and attending board meetings, I have completed the board member training course required by the state 
and attended the online conference sponsored by the Massachusetts chapter of the National Association of Housing and Redevelopment Officials and have had meetings with uh, Jack Cooper, the director of the Union of Massachusetts Public Housing Tenants. At Monotomy Manor, I have encouraged the expansion of the Monotomy Manor Garden Project and the organizing of a new Monotomy Manor Tennis Association. On the board, I have asked <clears throat> for the replacement of the leaky windows and doors in the Monotomy Manor apartments. And I am pleased to report that the formal assessment of these crucial issues will occur this fall. The formal assessment is necessary for applying for CPA and other funding mechanisms beginning in December with AHA seniors and those with disabilities until this spring. Uh, since then, I have had occasions to interact with Drake Village residents, which is one of the four elderly state-aided housing authorities and learned about their concerns. On an initial tour, I sat down and had conversations with several residents. One was in Spanish with a woman from Colombia. The other occasion was at a reception at Drake Village following a board meeting. In July, I had a meeting with the newly elected officers of the Cusack Terrace Tenants Organization. Excuse and me, Mr. About it, 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 I'm sorry, you're over the time. If you could, if, if you're wrapping up, if you could just uh, wrap it up in the next few seconds, that would be great. Okay. Um, going forward, my desire is to serve all of those who live in the Arlington Housing Authorities and work with the Board and Union of Massachusetts Public Housing Tenants to create the crucial conditions for them to have comfortable and productive lives. Thank you for considering me and I look forward to continuing my work with the board and advocating for tenants' rights. Thank you very much. Um, I'm not gonna go down the line, but by a show of hands, if there are any board members who have questions for Ms. Padilla, but before I do that, I see Attorney Heim has his hand up. I'm sorry, Mr. DeCourcy and Ms. Padilla. I just wanted to interject because I know that Mr. Hurd uh, wanted to say something at the outset of this. Um, so. I don't want to interrupt these these questions or Ms. Badia's consideration and discussion, but I wouldn't. Have that. I, I appreciate that, and I'm sorry uh, for missing that earlier. Yeah, Mr. Hurt. Yeah, no problem. Sorry, I, I didn't want to interrupt Ms. Badia's presentation, but um, I had I have spoken with Attorney Heim on this regarding. I do have a familiar relationship with the operations manager of the housing authority, who is currently serving as the interim executive director. And I have spoken with Attorney Heim, who we've come to the conclusion that I can participate in the discussion and vote on this matter. But just to clear any potential appearance of conflict of interest and in the interest of uh, full disclosure, I am going to just recuse myself and, from the discussion and vote on this particular item. Okay, thank you, Mr. Hurd. Thank you. Okay. Is there any um, any board members who have questions for Ms. Padilla? Okay. Thank you very much, Ms. Padilla. Thank you. Okay. Next on the list is Dylan Dalton. do not see Dylan Dalton in the attendee list, Mr. Chair. Okay. All right, we'll go back if, if there is, uh, if we do receive word later before we um, open nominations. Um, next on the list, Pat, Patricia Dunleavy was, is, is still on the list. And as I said, she had submit, submitted written materials. She is not able to be with us tonight, but um, I know board members have looked at the written submission and we will consider that as part of the vote this evening. Um, next is Pamela Hauser. Okay, I can promote Pam. Okay, should be coming up right now. Good evening, Ms. Hauser. Um, oh, got to unmute. Good evening, gentlemen and ladies of the board of, of the town of Arlington. Um, my qualifications, I am a lifelong resident of the town of Arlington. I was born and raised here. I have a degree in business management and administration. 
I worked for the federal government for 17 years. I left after 9-11 when at the time I was on the phone with a gentleman who was at the Pentagon and got killed while I was talking to him on the phone, which was quite a thing. I raised three children at Monotomy Manor through the 70s and 80s. I have, I have a unique perspective in the Arlington Housing Authority. My father, Robert Hauser, was the first executive director of the Arlington Housing Authority from 1949 to 1975 when he passed away from cancer at the age of 53. I have, I feel I, that the AJ needs a level head and it's decisions that need to become before the board. And I feel I give that. I have been attained, I was in, in very vocal in obtaining new elevators for Winslow Towers and new windows, which are currently under construction. I have the qualifications that I feel are required to be on this board. I, I am very vocal. I have been president of Winslow Towers for the past eight years. And the tenants don't want me to leave. And according to the regulations, I do not have to give up that position. I, my duties at the federal government, I was a GS5 secretary, but my duties included that of secretary, supply manager, equipment manager. I was in charge of space allocation, phone allocations, liaison for a building being built and security. I feel I am quite qualified to handle the Arlington Housing Authority and I am very willing. And I know all the other presidents of all the elders. Thank, thank you, Ms. Hauser. You're just about at your time limit. So if you just have a concluding sentence or so, that, that that's fine. Okay. I just feel I'm very qualified for this position. I hope the board will consider my appointment. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, do any board members have any questions for Ms. Hauser? Okay, thank you, Ms. Hauser. Thank you very much for your consideration. Sure. Okay, next is, and, and as, as I said, Alicia Jones is no longer a candidate. Cynthia McGinty is next. Mr. Chairman, I do not see Cynthia McGinty, either. Next, and again, if, if, if Ms. McGinty joins us before we close the presentations, we'll allow her to come on. Um, next is Julia Moden. Mr. Chair, I do not see Julia Moden. Okay, and, and I will point out to the public, we did reach out to all of the candidates today to inform them that would, we would be having the meeting remotely and invited them to join us. We also reached out last week when we set this agenda item up, uh, when we reached out for additional written materials we offered the opportunity to present to the, to the board this evening. Um, okay, uh, Vanessa Russell. Okay, I think she is, I think she is here under a different uh, name. Let me see here. Um, Mr. Chair? Yes, Mrs. Mahan. I, I do see Ms. Roswell on chat, and if perhaps she's logged in under a different name. Maybe she can um, just provide that to chat. So, unless Mr. the town manager has found her. I think we have found Vanessa. Um, I did not submit my letter because um, with time restraints and a lot of other stuff going on, I've decided to withdraw. Okay. Let that be known. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so that that completes the list of candidates. Is there um, anyone else on the list of speakers or that we've heard through the chat? I, I do know that Ms. Jones and, and Ms. Dunleavy did contact the board office today. 
to let us know that they would not be able to make it. Um, why don't we have one more check to see if there is any uh, any others waiting? It does not appear so, Mr. Chair. Um, I would just ask if anybody is waiting to present and I'm not seeing your name, if you could try to raise your hand just to make sure that I'm not missing you. Okay, I'm not seeing any hands raised, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chaplain. Uh, I don't see any hands either uh, on that list. Okay, so what we will do now, I will open nominations, actually take a motion to open nominations. Anyone? So moved. Is there a second? Okay, seconded by Mr. Diggins. Um, so on a motion to open nominations by Mrs. Mahan, seconded by Mr. Diggins, Attorney Heim. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Hellman. Yes. Mrs. Mahan. Yes. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. It's a 4 0 vote. <laughs> okay. And again, I won't go down the line if there are any members that would like to nominate um, any of the individuals who su submitted expressions of interest. Uh, please do so now. Right, show of hands. Um, Mrs. Uh, Mahan. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, what I want to say from uh, the presentations we've gotten tonight, and I mean this with all sincerity, as well as um, we did have some um, written attestations uh, sent to us, um, we have so many candidates that um, really, really would like to uh, appoint them all. However, I do know, as, as part of what we've heard and, and and or read, um, the majority, if not all of them, are very actively involved um, in AHA properties and, and working with their neighbors and also working through COVID-19. And I read some of that uh, statements of things that they did safely. Um, and I wanna thank you on behalf of the town um, because everybody was really just getting on this ride and trying to figure out how to maneuver it. Um, uh, with that, I would like to nominate uh, Fiorella Badilla. Thank you, is there a second? Second from Mr. Diggins, um, okay. Any other nominations? Okay, seeing, seeing none. Um, Mr. Chair, could I? Yes. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, could I move to close nominations? Uh, yeah, I was just gonna ask that. Yep, no, absolutely. Uh, do we have a second? Okay, uh, motion to close nominations uh, by Mrs. Mahan, seconded by Mr. Diggins. Attorney Heim. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Hellman. Yes. Mrs. Mahan. Yes. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Okay. And now uh, we, with one, one individual nominated, and I also want to thank everybody who expressed interest in the housing authority position and um, for submitting written materials and being involved um, in, in, in the town. Um, so with that, we have one nomination before the board. Attorney Heim. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Helmuth. Yes. Mrs. Mahan. Yes. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. It's a four zero vote. Great, thank you very much. Could we bring back Ms. Padilla for just a moment? Hello. Ms. Padilla, yeah, congratulations and, and uh, want to thank you for your presentation tonight and uh, um, for, for the work that you described over the past several months. And as we said at the beginning of the session, this is a two-year appointment. And, and just again, I, mentioned, I meant to mention this earlier, we had confirmed that all of the candidates were registered voters in Arlington. That is a requirement. And, and um, so everybody met that requirement. And um, I don't know if any of the board members have anything that they want to add, but wanted to bring you back to congratulate you. I appreciate that. Thank you, guys. I'm so looking forward to the next two years. Great, great. Uh, Mr. Diggins. Yeah, and I just wanted to add that I am um, I'm really happy uh, that you wanted to um, continue working with AHA. And, uh, 
there are lots of reasons that uh, I nominated you back in um, December. And, and from what I hear from other members of the, of the board and uh, my colleague, and um, you've done very well. Uh, I have intentionally not be hovered be it all, be out of respect be for, for you and, 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 and also as a sign of my confidence to me and, and be part of wanting you to be on the board was for you to grow into the role and then grow, also grow um, as a person who uh, is interested in civic engagement. And, and I think you've done a great job, you know, and, and I encourage you to continue um, working uh, with us and, and uh, maybe even in, in larger realms. So thanks for continuing. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. I actually would like to comment. I look forward to working uh, in involving youth around Arlington to local government. So thank you. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. Uh, Mrs. Mahan. Um, just no matter what, it's a board of five. Originally, Ms. Vadella came in to fill out Mr. Murray's seat. Someone had asked me now um, if uh, she were successful for the tenant seat, um, what happens to Mr. Murray's seat. And I don't know if you, Mr. Chair or Attorney Hine, I think it's sort of an osmosis situation, but um, if, if somebody could just provide more clarity on that. Yeah, and, and Attorney, correct me if I'm wrong, but this tenant seat effectively, Mr. Murray's seat is effectively now the tenant seat. And so that will be merged and will, from this point forward, be the tenant seat. Mr. Chairman, that's correct. Yeah, the, the, the way it works is if there was no vacancy, uh, we would have had a different process, but because Mr. Murray vacated the seat, we were able to appoint Ms. Uh, Badila to uh, fill that vacancy uh, until such time as the uh, regulations had been promulgated. Um, so they are essentially now the, the, the same line of, of seats. Great, thank, thank you, Attorney Heim. Uh, anything further, Mrs. Mahan? No, I want to say thank you to both Learned Council uh, for clarifying that. I wanted to make sure. Um, thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Helmuth? Uh, thank you very much, and congratulations, Ms. Padilla. Thank you for your willingness to serve your community. Thank you. Thank you very much, and then best, best of luck moving forward, Ms. Padilla. Appreciate that. Thank you, guys. Have a great night. Sure. You too. Okay. Um, so that concludes item two. We will wait for Mr. Hurd to get back. I, I will announce agenda item three, uh, approval of sale of $162,225 sewer bond to the Massachusetts Water Resources Authority for inflow and infiltration local financial assistance program. Phyllis Marshall, our town treasurer, um, will be presenting and I believe she's here with us. I am, sorry. Good, good evening, Ms. Marshall. Good evening. Um, I am uh, before you uh, at seeking your approval of this bond of 162,225. It is the loan portion of the project that was submitted by um, Mr. Rademacher. Uh, there is also a grant from the MWRA in the amount of $486,675 for 75% of that project. And the scope of that project is um, was submitted to you um, for design, bid, and award for improvements to rehabbing and reconstruction of the sewer system and uh, related facilities. Um, and also for post-construction um, flow evaluation from a previous phase of project. So it's a great opportunity for us. It's interest-free loan. And um, so I um, would hope that um, in accordance with the 2020 annual town meeting vote of Article 59, um, you would um, give positive consideration to this um, sale. Great. Thank you, Ms. Marshall. I'll turn to the board now. Mrs. Mahan. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. 
Uh, first, I'd like to uh, move approval. And I just have one very quick question, if I could. Go, go uh, right ahead. Uh, on page 10, under scope of services, yes. um, I understand sometimes numbers are used as numbers and sometimes they're used as sort of non-numbers. So I just wanted, I just had a question where task one and two are part of phase number 13 and task three, the closeout is part of page number 11. Is there a 12? And, and I only say this that if for some reason there was a typo, which I'm sure there isn't, so. Uh, there is a phase 12, um, but I don't have information on this project right now. Um, it, I don't, I, I think it's underway, but I can't okay. be no, that's certain. Fine. I can follow up with Mr. Rodemacher. Yes, if you could, and if you, uh, as, as a follow up to that follow up, um, I'm going to assume because we can only authorize and vote what's contained here before us um, under scope of services. Um, I'm assuming uh, phase 12 will have an additional cost and we'll have to deal with that in the future. And if you just could, um, after you follow up with Mr. Rademacher or whoever else you deem appropriate on what phase 12 is, if just there's some sort of approximation or estimate. Um, not asking where the funding is going to come from, just, um, and that would be it. And I, I want to thank uh, Madam Treasurer. Uh, you've done such an exemplary job that I never really come in and bug you or anything <laughs> because everything's running so well, including the staff in the office who are very appreciative. Um, so uh, I'd like to see a woman um, in our upper ranks. Uh, so I, I do appreciate that. And with that, I'll turn it back to the chairman. Thank you for the leniency there. Thank you, Mrs. Mahan. Mr. Hurd. Uh, thank you, and thank you for the presentation. I will move, I will second the motion, and uh, no further comments. Okay, thank you, Mr. Hurd. Uh, Mr. Diggins. Oh, he broke my streak of seconds. <laughs> okay, we just lost you. Any, any further comments? Or? No comments. Okay, thank you. And Mr. Helmuth. No comments, thank you. Great, thank you. And I have no comments either. Thank you for the presentation, Ms. Marshall. Okay, on a motion by Mrs. Mahan, seconded uh, by Mr. Hurd to approve the sale of the, the bonds. Attorney Heim. <clears throat> Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Helmuth. Yes. Mrs. Mahan. Yes. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Great. You know, thank Mr. you very much, Ms. Marshall. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Attorney Heim. Um, agenda item four, presentation, bus network redesign. Uh, Daniel Amstutz, I believe the town manager, Mr. Chapdelain, will be introducing this item and we have a, at least one or two guests from the MBTA with us tonight. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. So I just promoted Melissa, uh, I'm, I'm gonna pronounce her last name wrong, likely Dilia from the MBTA and she will be providing the board an update on the MBTA uh, bus network redesign uh, program that they'd like to bring the board up to speed on and answer any questions that the board might have. Great, thank you, Mr. Chapdelaine. Good evening, Ms. Delia. Is, is that correct on the pronunciation? Uh, it's delay. Delay, okay, we're sorry. No worries. Okay, yeah, the, the, the floor is yours. And we, we did receive the um, presentation in our agenda. There's some written materials that we received, but uh, go right ahead. Fantastic. So I will take about 10 minutes to go through the presentation that was provided to you, and I'll let you know when I'm changing uh, pages. So just uh, by introduction, my name is Melissa DeLay. I'm Senior Director of Service Planning for the MBTA. I've been here for 21 years, um, and I'm pleased to be before you, uh, members of the select board and uh, town manager. Excuse me one second, Mr. Lady. Mr. Chaplain, is there a way that we can share the presentation just for the public's benefit? There it is. Okay. Yeah, if you can say, sorry to interrupt, but that way it will be right there in front of us. Super. That's a lot easier to follow. Thanks for the idea. Sure. Uh, so if you go to the next slide, um, the main takeaway uh, here is that we have a number of initiatives under the umbrella of the Better Bus Project, whether that is bus priority or fleet and facilities modernization or operations processes. But among these is the bus network redesign. So I'll talk a little bit more about that on the next slide. So what is a bus network redesign? 
Uh, it's a complete reimagining of the MBTA's bus network to better reflect the travel needs of the region and create a better experience for current and future riders. And what we're looking to achieve through that is better frequency, uh, service that's fast and reliable, and making sure that we're connecting to key destinations and creating a legible network that's simple and easy to use. So on the next slide, uh, I uh, am showing that uh, a bus network redesign generally serves the same neighborhoods and streets, but it connects them in different ways to make a network that is better for riders. So on the left uh, sort of sample illustration, uh, we have here, you have a lot more routes with deviations where they might be on one corridor and then they turn off to go to other corridors. You have a lot more complexity and it, in, in the end, you actually have less frequency on any single route. Uh, on the right example, this is showing a lot more direct services uh, it's simpler and more legible. And because the routes aren't taking these deviations to get to other places, you end up with uh, more frequency on any single route uh, due to those shorter routes, uh, even though those two networks might use the same number of bus resources being you know, buses and operators. So uh, that's what we're hoping to achieve with a bus network redesign. Through route change, you can get better frequency, better legibility, uh, and easier to understand routes for um, our existing riders, but also for you know, new or infrequent riders who might see that as being a real barrier to understanding a bus service. Uh, on the next slide, um, I'm just trying to show what you can expect through a bus network redesign process. Uh, we're looking to see a more equitable network a network that's simpler and easier to understand, uh, more high frequency corridors, better connections to major local and regional destinations. We've heard very many folks say that, you know, our existing network, you know, dates in many cases, you can look at routes from the 40s and see the exact same routes. Uh, but that means that places that have seen a lot of development since then, whether that be, you know, Kendall Square or uh, the Longwood Medical Area, are sometimes left out of our existing network connections. Uh, and we also want to focus on all day service with more buses in the midday, evening, and weekends. And I'll just underscore on that last point. Um, this has been part of our plan for the last two years, but uh, with COVID and the changes to the way that people work, we think that's probably going to transform into differences in the future of work and that, you know, the peaks might be a little less peaky in the future uh, if there continues to be some sort of some number of hybrid workforce. Uh, maybe not coming in every day uh, through the week, but you know, even two or three or four days per week can mean uh, that we can uh, reallocate some of those peak period resources into other parts of the day and have a, a more all day type network. Uh, on the next slide, uh, we start getting into some of the metrics that we're going to use to for the success of our new networks. And to that end, we actually just in June added three new metrics to our service delivery policy, uh, which is what defines how we sort of score ourselves in terms of service quality. Uh, we added three new metrics, uh, looking at equity, looking at access and looking at competitiveness. Now in terms of equity, uh, we'd be looking at how are we providing uh, transit critical populations uh, with equitable transit service. And by transit critical populations, I mean, you know, how are we serving low income populations, people of color, seniors, people with disabilities, and low or no car households? Because we found uh, that those are people who are more likely to be using our transit services. Um, and then similarly, how are we connecting people to the places that are most important to them? And I'm going to uh, get into some really interesting uh, data sources that we're using uh, on that metric in particular. And lastly, is the MBTA a good choice for people who are making these trips? Um, and that gets at competitiveness. You know, uh, is a is the travel time for a transit trip competitive with what someone would be making uh, with the travel time someone would use to make that same trip biking or walking? How much of a difference is that? Because often our trips are very radially oriented, uh, which means that we can have really long travel times for some of these kind of cross town circumferential trips, you know, thinking like, you know, Arlington to Medford or other suburbs that are close, uh, simple to bike or drive to, but very complicated in some cases to use transit for. Uh, on the next slide, um, this gets into one of our upcoming uh, data sources 
um, that we're using. This is the first uh, initiative in my uh, knowledge at the MBTA where we've used location-based services data. And what that is, is uh, cell phone data that's been anonymized that we can use to monitor uh, no individuals. Of course, that's been anonymized, but looking at what overall trip making is in the MBTA's service area. Uh, and it's looking to see not just for transit trips, but all trip making, whether that's walking or biking or driving, because one of the things, you know, traditionally we do a lot of work with ridership data, but inherent in that ridership data is what your network is. And we wanted to take sort of a blank sheet approach to say, well, where do people want to go? Uh, not just where we go today. So um, it's a really exciting and rich data source that we've been mining. Uh, so uh, on the next slide, uh, you can see, uh, actually, sorry, there was one important point on the previous one, if I could just go back. Um, one other thing that's really interesting about this new location-based services data is that you can tag it to a certain geography and associated with that geography are demographics. Like I was mentioning, it's very important to us to look at um, our transit critical ridership and the way we get that isn't from knowing who has a specific cell phone device because it's anonymized so we don't actually know that um, but we are able to tag it to the demo demographics of a particular geography and then we can actually see how that tr uh, person's travel uh, is linked with multiple trips so it's not just that people are only ever taking trips from their home to work or home to wherever it is that they're going. But in many cases, people are going from home to daycare and then daycare to work and then work to the grocery store. And they're chaining together those trips that might be you know, multiple trips through multiple geographies. And the streetlight uh, location-based services data that we get is able to follow that individual and keep the demographics of that trip as we follow it around. So as we're looking at how different trips are being served by a network that we create, we're able to look at the demography of that. Because often you have um, people with all sorts of demographic backgrounds traveling kind of in other areas through, you know, downtown Boston especially is often a tricky place where many of the trips in downtown Boston aren't by people who necessarily live there. So it's able to give us um, better information that's really exciting for us to use and helps us to use some of these uh, new uh, metrics that I've been mentioning earlier. So uh, going to the next slide, um, there's a lot of detail here, but it's just at a very high level talking about uh, the data that we are using from the streetlight uh, data and then how that gets um, kind of drilled down to say, okay, here are the areas of demand that we look at and here are the connections of certain or, uh, origins to destination location that create corridors those get snapped to, to specific roadways, looking at you know, where are there busable streets that meet our grade requirements, that don't have low clearance bridges, um, that uh, are on streets that are appropriate for bus usage. And then lastly, uh, we haven't quite gotten to this stage yet, but how do we turn those into specific bus routes that have starting locations and ending locations and layover locations and stops and all those other things that we need to do to create uh, actual bus routes. So. Uh, in terms of the process, um, we are starting with the process of creating the high frequency corridors so that we can have uh, those lead conversations with municipalities about where we can uh, look to create priority treatments, which can help us uh, unlock even more corridors as we're designing these routes. Um, but in terms of high frequency, what I mean by that is, you know, routes that look like today's Route 77, where you have service that runs seven days a week, um, you know, minimum frequency is every 10 minutes or better, uh, or maybe even uh, more frequent than that during rush hours, with a span of service that goes from the, you know, 5 a.m. till past midnight. So that's the type of service that we want to have more of, because it's simple. You don't even need a schedule to show up often. You can just be confident that you'll show up and there'll be a service there and you don't have to be tied to a specific schedule. So imagine the Route 77, but more of that is what we're trying to create. Um, at the same time, in order to create more of that, the way that we can allocate more resources to places is to have infrastructure to support it, whether that means um, bus priority, either you know bus lanes, if there's right of way to support that, or in places with more uh, tight, 
roadways, if it means you know transit signal priority and queue jumps at congested intersections, or other um, even you know other types of uh, investments of you know the bus stops where we can put parking and layover locations are also important. Um, and then lastly, uh, these would be presented to the public through a different type of route nomenclature so that people would know that this is a different kind of service. Um, we haven't gotten into this detail, but my vision is to, you know, show this on, you know, if we could have it on a spider map in every subway station so that the high frequency bus network would be as legible and iconic as that um, spider map that shows, you know, where all the rapid transit lines go. And if you can show where all the other places you can get to that are high frequency, that you can uh, expect that uh, high quality, uh, reliable service. So, so that's the, um, the, uh, the vision. So on the next slide, we get into uh, the five year implementation timeline. Uh, we're here now where we're working on a draft network. Um, the plan is to uh, be able to share specific actual routes in the fall uh, and have a more extensive public process. Uh, the plan is to adopt the final network in early 22 and to implement over the course of perhaps the earliest implementation could be in fall of 2022 uh, with continued implementation. This would be our roadmap for say the next five years of where we would implement changes. The earliest changes would be more things like uh, changes that don't require, you know, uh, new accessible bus stops or new construction of bus priority. If it's a matter of kind of changing signage uh, and reallocating our existing buses, those are the things that would be most likely to be implemented up front. Uh, we'd probably do kind of waves by geography, um, you know, routes in the west versus routes in the south at a different time, just to kind of make it easier to get the signage uh, updated rather than you know, update all the signs overnight. Uh, and then there, there might be other things that do require um, more capital type work that uh, implementation would come as those projects allow it. For example, you know, we've long talked about making more transit connectivity into the Longwood medical area, but many of those um, would only really be possible with a lot more transit priority through some very congested streets or making more like transit hubs in that area. So those are the types of things that might take a little while to uh, implement. Uh, on the next slide, at a very high level, uh, just trying to say that, you know, we're, we're all here to try to make a better rider experience. Um, and we're focused on kind of the upper right hand corner of this slide with the bus network redesign, uh, how we need a new network that goes where people need it to go and when they need it. And that's easier to understand. But this all exists in the context of other initiatives that are ongoing at the MBTA, whether that's bus priority, uh, whether that's fleet and facilities, electrification of the bus fleet, uh, et cetera. So um, I just have a couple more slides. Um, we recognize that change will probably be hard. Uh, we can make the network better for the vast majority of current riders, but to make that happen, many people's trips will change. And for some people, it will get worse. Um, in Houston, and we use Houston as, as an example, one of our consultant team members is a former board member from Houston where they engaged in a similar uh, reimagining of their bus network. Um, and there, the number of riders with all day existing service tripled and ridership grew by 17% in the end when they implemented. But the public complaints in the five months before implementation outnumbered positives 330 to one. So we recognize change is hard, um, but that to truly transform the network, we need to take uh, we need to make trade-offs and we're using everything we've heard from writers to think through that. And then also just to illustrate that, um, we have some graphics here on the map. Uh, the, these are actually from Miami. Uh, on the top, you have kind of their pre-bus uh, network redesign network. And then below you have their um, post network redesign network. Uh, above you can see that they value shorter walks to the buses. So you can see there's a lot more routes and they're a lot more closely spaced. Whereas the, the bottom network values more of those high frequency connections. They're saying that it's okay to walk a little bit farther if it means that you're walking to a high quality transit. And the, the way you can tell is those red routes in the bottom are more of those like high frequency, think like today's 
key bus routes type services where you can walk up and expect a bus, you know, pretty much any time of the day. Uh, so you can see the trade-off we're looking to make is can we get you know more high frequency, even if it makes it means that some people might have to walk farther for certain treatment. So uh, on the next slide, what are our commitments? Equity, first and foremost, we want truly transformational change. Uh, we want a better network for the people who ride today. We want extensive stakeholder engagement. Uh, we actually want to implement this in the near term. And we want to integrate service changes with bus priority and other infrastructure to maximize benefit. But we need your help to make this happen. So uh, on the next slide, municipal partnerships are a key to success. Uh, we can only succeed at implementation where we have partnerships with municipalities that can help us advance change. Uh, and those partnerships can take several forms. Uh, we need effective transit priority in congested corridors. That can mean bus lanes. It can also mean queue jumps and transit signal priority. But uh, some of the other kind of unsung heroes of the municipal partnerships, I like to call them, are things like layover locations because we need a place to turn the bus around. Those five minutes at the end of the line are critical for us to maintain reliability of trip departure times. Uh, they're critical for ensuring that you know, the operator can find a place for their operator break and can use the restroom somewhere. Um, and often it's, it's a challenge to site layover locations, especially when you have like congested uh, busy urban areas with uh, shop owners and delivery services and parking I know can be at a premium in certain uh, urban portions of our network. Uh, we also need bus shelters, finding uh, places or doing construction to get accessible bus stops. And uh, also very important, we need new and upgraded garages to be able to operate the service. Many of our garages are sort of at their useful life and we're having lots of conversations on uh, how to either uh, upgrade those or in some cases potentially replace those uh, just to maintain existing capacity. And then also we're having conversations about what it would take to increase uh, our capacity to store buses so that we can, you know, in the context of um, potential future expansion. So in terms of uh, bus network redesign, public outreach, we are sort of in the middle, though today is a little bit earlier because this was from an earlier deck, uh, so pardon that. Um, but the plan is that we're going to have a draft network this fall, uh, which will be associated with uh, more uh, public outreach. Uh, we've also started having some um, kind of leading outreach actually today. I'm pleased we had uh, a meeting with town manager uh, and a number of staff from community development, um, economic development, uh, the Arlington Police Department's traffic department was there um, to start having those conversations about partnerships uh, in Arlington specifically. And we've been having a round of outreach with many of our core municipalities uh, for those similar conversations as well. And then uh, implementation, as I mentioned, we're looking to get to implementation by approximately fall of 2022 as at least the, the, the leading start of implementation. And again, that will be a multi-year process. So with that, I will uh, end my presentation and I was pretty close to 10 minutes and I will ask if uh, there are any questions. Great, thank, thank you, Ms. DeLay. And I, I'll, I will turn to the board for questions or comments. Uh, Mr. Hurd. Thank you and thank you for the presentation. Um, it's, I think change can be hard, but done in the right way can certainly lead to improvements. Um, we've people in Arlington definitely use the bus system. They value the bus system and will have a lot of input from both town staff, town leaders and residents as to what we could do to increase efficiency of the bus systems. We've, we have already taken steps with the bus rapid transit program that we went through to move towards bus prioritization that, that's been very well received. And so I look forward to what, suggest, what if any suggestions will come out of that. Um, I, I guess the good thing in Arlington is all, all of our routes are already for the most part on some of our more centralized uh, thoroughfares. So it should, I don't anticipate there'll be major changes. Um, 
but I am excited to see what we can come up with. And um, it's good to hear that you'll be looking for input and public engagement and partnerships in order to, because every municipal, municipality is different and changes that work in one municipality might not work well for another one. So we'll be happy to be part of the process. Um, I know Mr. Diggins will be intricately involved in that. We'll have many discussions with you, I'm sure, about the, what what uh, changes we need and what routes we need to keep. Um, what? Just one question, if you know, and I assume just in the COVID era that ridership is quite down. As far as the what weight of the um, ridership data, is that based on pre-COVID numbers or is it going to be more, is it current ridership data? And I only ask because the one thing that we've been blessed with in Arlington is a very careful and conscientious uh, residence in light of the, the pandemic. And whereas, you know, we had very, we had a lot of ridership before COVID, you know, I'm sure in Arlington it's far down because people are just cautious about their exposure. So is it going to be both pre-COVID numbers versus current numbers or just current numbers? That's a very fair question. So thanks for bringing that up. So when I've been mentioning the location-based services cell phone data that we're using to drive a lot of the planning for the network, uh, that's all using pre-COVID data. Uh, we're not comfortable that if we were to use today's numbers that those are necessarily representative of what the long-term plans are. So the, the one thing that's also interesting is that we're trying to create a process that's replicable so that say in five years or you know some point in the future, we could use this process again to uh, try to see what gaps are to account for any you know changes in the future of work because there's a lot of questions as to you know how much of the changes are going to turn out to be permanent but we just don't have a crystal ball to show that right now um, but we want to be able to do something that's replicable and then also um, something that might acknowledge you know developments that we know are already in the pipeline um, because we're basing it on 2019 data like or even developments that have come online in the last uh, two years, like that's not in the data. So um, again, we're using pre-COVID data, but we want to do something that's replicable so that we can uh, continue to update and look for, you know, gaps where, um, you know, maybe the transit system isn't serving a, a large amount of trip making well. Thank you, and thank you for the presentation. Thank, thank you, Mr. Hurd. Uh, Mr. Diggins. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Melissa. It is so delightful to see you. You know, so <laughs> Melissa, I, I've known Melissa since the beginning of the Rider Oversight Committee in several capacities, you know, at the MBTA and CTPS, right? Central Transportation Planning Staff? Mm -hmm. No, nope, just MBTA. Just MBTA, okay. Yeah. You know, uh, so, uh, and, and she's just been so helpful uh, to the Rider Oversight Committee in helping us understand a lot about service delivery. And I'll say, it's because of knowing how involved you've been with service delivery that is the only reason I'm a little skeptical about the bus redesign thing because because I know all that went into making you know our current system um, work as well as it does you know, uh, because it's a, it's a complicated system because I mean our road network is complicated and then on top of that you have all these cars and, and the buses work really well if there aren't any cars. There, you know, and and I think whatever redesign we do, if we don't somehow minimize the cars, we you know, we're going to still have bus bunching being and other problems that affect um, service. So I think it's going to be incumbent upon a lot of us, me you know, in the various municipalities, to do what we can to get those cars off the road to emphasize the sustainable aspect of not having so many single occupancy, occupancy vehicles and maybe you know, working on car sharing. So we're gonna have to come at this um, from multiple angles. Uh, uh, so, and the, the equity um, part is gonna be a little bit challenging because we, they, it'll be interesting to see if those who suffer a less uh, convenient ride, for lack of a better word, or, or, or those who you said would, would find that uh, things are a little worse, meaning if they don't fall into a certain category that then becomes problematic. So, so um, you certainly have um, you slash we 
have our work uh, cut out for us. And, and you know, with respect to that bus garage, I don't know if anyone ever told you about my idea for uh, the bus garage. I kind of campaigned on it. It'd be in Arlington Center. It'd be below uh, uh, with a big tower of opportunity and, and, and innovation on top of it, which can also help with some of our housing and, and financial base. And, and, and I could go on. But I'm not, uh, because we have a very long agenda, and I know I have a lot of access to you. But thank you so much, Amy, for coming. It really has been a pleasure seeing you, listening to you. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. Uh, Mr. Helmuth. Thank you. Thank you for a great presentation. Um, following one of the points that my colleague, Mr. Diggins, made, I kind of have a, a bigger picture question for you. Um, I fully appreciate and, and applaud that your starting place is, is equity and the writers and the people writing the system now and making sure that they have an optimal experience to get where they want to go. I think that's your mission. Um, but another lens to look at transit is, is sustainability. And you know the UN's devastating report on the climate change that just came out in the last 24 hours or so you know, reminded us all that we're running out of time. So we know that for lots of reasons, not just, you know, including helping the buses run better, but we need to reduce the number of single car trips particularly. And so my, my question is when the MBTA sets its metrics and sets its goals, does it also, to what extent does it look at um, increasing ridership and yes, including the people who ride now, but people who aren't riding, people who would ride if there were better transit to where they needed to go? And um, would the MBT even go so far as to say how many car trips can, can we replace? And you know, I know that, that some of that is structural, some of that is, is your charge from the legislature and, and from the government. So, um, yeah, but I'm, I'm curious to what extent that perspective informs the work that you do, the goals that you set and the metrics by which you measure yourselves for this kind of program. Those are some uh, really interesting questions. And while like transitioning, uh, doing mode shift isn't explicitly a goal, I think that the, the way that we're going about this by looking at all trip making, which does include, include you know, general auto motorist trips as well, and trying to say, you know, can we improve our competitiveness? Because oftentimes mm -hmm. those motorists are driving because the transit trip is truly terrible and it really is their best option. and you, you can't expect someone to take like three buses and two transfers to get, you know, just across town on what's a very simple drive. So I think um, I think we can get at what you're getting at, even though that's not explicitly one of the things that we're, we're looking at. Great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. And I, you know, I noted uh, that um, if it's a side effect, it's a good one that in Houston, you know, ridership went up. And I think um, th this is probably something that municipal leaders who, who want to act locally on climate and in transit probably need to be in contact with our state leaders to say that maybe this can be part of the MBT's job too, you know, that, to provide some type top down um, guidance, uh, guidance about that, how we think about transit um, from both ends, both from serving the riders, but also in, in, in growing that, that mode shift, which is a new term I've learned and I'm not in any danger of being uh, being Len Diggins, but I'm glad to learn a new transit term. So thank you. Uh, no further no further questions. Thanks again. Thank you, Mr. Helmuth. Uh, Mrs. Mahan. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I don't know if we need to have a move receipt or if so I'll that, make that would move. be great. Yes. Okay. And then <clears throat> I'm going to try to be brief. And if there are any, hopefully of my three or four questions that there's a lot of information about um, if we could, as a board, uh, get the, that further on down the road. Um, and the first one may not really, but I think it might come under public hearings and gathering information. Um, I know that the uh, labor workforce development, uh, along with the DOT, Department of Transportation, um, recently, it was a really quick study, I think it was only like six months, um, came out with traffic data related to each of their purviews, uh, workforce development around the hybrid remote model and DOT in terms of uh, scheduling projects uh, on the state's highways and 
uh, other state-owned property. And what they came out with is that they're seeing a trend that, uh, especially with the remote hybrid working, that uh, Monday, Friday uh, is more turning into a lighter day. Uh, tell some people coming out of Boston, but believe it or not, and the, the Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, the ones that the, the roads are really um, crowded parking lot, even pre-COVID. So I would just ask, and this may already be being considered, considered that when we talk about uh, buses, I, I would not know we would want to see the same situation where whatever the routes are, Monday and Friday, you can get on there, you feel real safe because, you know, there's three rows before there's another person. And then if what the initial modeling, if, and it is brand new, there's only one study that's come out, but it seems like it's gonna bear out uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, more cars on the road, which equates to also Tuesday, Wednesday, third, Thursday, more riders on the team. So you all have to study that um, and, and figure it out, but that would be one of my uh, adding a public participation sort of thing. And then, um, I'll keep going. Okay, um, the next question or questions, I wanna have the caveat. I am not trying to be uh, get brownie points and apples for my teachers with the uh, planning and community development director as well as our energy manager. But our next discussion is um, on Arlington's uh, net zero action plan. And I only, I wouldn't ask these questions, but on your presentation on slide 10, um, it's sort of superficially um, discussed, um, but then on slide 11, it's more explicitly discussed. So I have two, maybe three questions, if you know, if not, um, or maybe it's still in discussion. Um, what the board is gonna discuss amongst many other things um, are, is adopting a zero emission municipal fleet and charging infrastructure plan, um, no later than, there's more words to it, no later than 2030. Do you know, has the MBTA done that or something similar to it? Maybe it's not 2030. I know we do have folks who are looking at uh, future bus fleets and specifically adoption of electric buses. I don't know the exact time frame, but I'd be happy to uh, get Scott Hamway or um, Bill Wolfgang to um, communicate to you what those time frames are. We have. We have a fleet and facilities plan that has dates and uh, mm -hmm. estimates, uh, but I just, I'm not familiar with that. Okay, if you could just find out, I know pretty much, not pretty much nationally, but trending nationally is, is discussing this by 2050. Arlington's uh, a little more uh, trying to be um, upfront and leading with the 2030. So if you could find out that question, if you're 2030, 2050 for zero emissions um, for your fleet, not municipal and other, you know, dial a ride, things like that. And then my second question would be, and again, referencing the um, pages 10 and 11, um, I, I would be interested as well as with my colleagues um, and perhaps this can come through our colleague, Mr. Diggin, Diggins getting the information, getting back to us, but um, on that same sort of line of questioning, um, you do say, fleet and facilities, we need to replace old buses. And, you know, kind of the question that I'm asking about zero emissions for your fleet. And then when I look at um, the implementation timeline, five years, which brings you to 2026, I don't really see anything in there unless, um, I don't see there anything in there about that particular area. So my question would be, is it in there, but it's another, facet of the MBTA and a different uh, committee and consultant that's discussing that? Or does it mean it's not in up until 2026, it's gonna be sometime after? So those would be my questions. So if you wanna take a hit at any of them or if you'd rather just go back and make sure to get all the information, I'm happy with that. And thank you. I, I only ask this because I'm brand new to Arlington's Net Zero uh, Committee. Believe it or not, unlike tonight, I try to say next to nothing because they're all the professionals and uh, that they've been doing this and know it inside and out. So um, I'm taking a little bit of knowledge that I've sat and listened and learned from them and using it here. So thank you, Mr. Lane. And thanks for those comments. I'm happy to tackle that last one in particular um, at, with a, a little bit, but um, 
just at a very high level, you know, this is the bus network redesign. So we're looking at root changes that we can implement over the next five years. There are other people who are working on a separate initiative, looking at bus fleet and bus facilities. That's like a 30 year plan because, you know, life cycles of buses are, you know, 12 years and life cycles of garages are like 30 years and, you know, getting all those kind of spaced out um, appropriately so that you have swap space where you can shift buses as you're doing construction in one garage and moving to the next one. That's a decades long process. Uh, so, uh, you know, this is interfacing with that project and it's influenced by the fleet facilities project, but it's totally separate in terms of like they're on a very different time scale than we are. No, I, I totally understand that. That's a court reporter in me. It's kind of like if you put something in the document, you've now opened that door. Uh -huh. So I guess what I would say is if you're going to make this presentation, I mean, I truly want it for the, the knowledge and information. I'm not saying other people won't. You may want to rewrite that or since it's not in your 2026 20, plan of what, what you oversee, um, you may not want to put it in there because I know as uh, my engine is unstable. Um, somebody's going to ask you a question if it's in there like that. So actually, they're going to ask me that question even if it's not there. That's why you put it there because <laughs> people are like, "Oh, bus network redesign." Oh, so no, no, electric yeah. bus. Like everybody is asking about that. So I, I definitely appreciate that question. No. But then also, um, one of the um, first questions you also had um, was about the um, days of the week, which is actually really interesting because during COVID, our busiest day has been Friday of all things. So even though, you know, employment-wise, we see that long-term people are thinking about coming in three days a week and maybe working from home on Monday, Friday. That's kind of what we've heard from some of our surveys of um, employers in the Boston area that we've been conducting or uh, that our Office of Performance Management and Innovation has been conducting. Um, but like I said, work trips aren't necessarily all the trips and we find that people are more likely to make other types of trips. And again, our highest ridership day is on Friday. And also really interesting, if you look at our ridership by time of day, uh, it's very, very stable on weekends. Um, so, you know, people still need to, you know, do their grocery shopping and do those other things and making all those other types of trips. So even though work commutes are way down right now, um, we still see uh, a lot of those off peak trips are still being made with the same frequency that they were made uh, beforehand. So, um, which underscores our uh, interest in creating sort of an all day, seven day a week, maybe Saturday and Sunday won't be exactly as crowded or as frequent as Monday through Friday, but um, but uh, a bit more, uh, you know, our, our Sunday frequencies are often far less frequent than even Saturdays and other days of the week. So we want to uh, make uh, a, a network that people can feel confident that, you know, they can use the transit service on weekends, that they don't need to go out and buy a car to do those errands, or that they don't have to go out and buy a second car to do those errands uh, in their household. So that's the type of things that we're uh, looking to do. Thank you, Ms. Delay, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank, thank you, Mrs. Mahan. I just have a couple of comments, but before I do that, could I have a second for Mrs. Uh, Mahan's motion to receive? Thank you, Mr. Diggins. Um, and thank you for the presentation tonight. They, one question I have, and I think it's great to have the, the Better Bus Project and you have a, a time frame spelled out here, but what about um, needs or demands that you're gonna identify in a shorter term? And, and what I'm thinking specifically is, the Green Line is going to be extended to Tufts very soon. The 80 bus leaves Arlington Center, goes right down Boston Ave and Medford. That seems to me to be a, the type of corridor that is, once the Green Line opens to, extends to Tufts, that there would be a lot of demand for particularly people from this area going to the North, North Station area, um, even to the airport. So how is this project being done with just other um, in conjunction with with looking at other needs of the, of the system, and um, and and I'm hoping that where demand is going to come up through the Green Line extension, that that it doesn't have to wait to go through this full process. For sure, um, and especially if we're talking about um, implementation of the earliest items in fall of 2022, that's very close to the. GLX is opening, you know, uh, in early 22, at least to the tough, uh, Medford Tufts portion of the line. Um, and and if I could also add one bit of context, there had been some proposed changes to the MBTA's bus services that had been um, recommended as part of the 
forging ahead process from last um, last spring that I'm sure uh, many are aware of. It was actually proposing elimination outright of the Route 80. Um, actually, that proposal, uh, once we got the CARES Act II funding, had been eliminated. And any future decisions about what the 80 or maybe a shortened version of the Route 80 uh, that wasn't duplicating so much of the Green Line extension, any of those um, future discussions were sort of pushed to this process, the bus network redesign, to say, let's not just have a knee-jerk reaction now that we have the, the CARES Act II funding so that we can be more deliberate, uh, have a, a, a more uh, inclusive public process and think about how best to connect areas to the Green Line extension. So um, we don't have all the routes identified yet, but certainly we are uh, aware of the Green Line extension opening and we'll be recommending changes that can complement uh, that uh, Green Line extension network. And just for um, uh, other, and uh, another example of uh, integration is that there is a uh, Silver Line extension uh, process that's ongoing um, that we're also looking to uh, integrate with. So we're, we're keeping an ear to the ground on a number of different uh, transportation projects, and we're hoping that this will kind of be uh, conscious of all those other changes. No, that's great. Thank you. And, and, and this certainly is more optimistic than what we saw in the uh forging ahead presentations earlier. There actually was a big concern with a number of the changes that were proposed for Arlington. Um, so I wanna thank you for the presentation. I also just wanna add one final thing, not a question, just a comment. Good luck on access to the to the Longwood Medical Area because that has been a issue for ages getting from Cambridge to, to, to Longwood without having to go downtown and out has always been a challenge. So uh, best of luck with that. Um, on a motion, to receive from Mrs. Mahan, seconded by Mr. Diggins. Attorney Heim. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Helmuth. Yes. Mrs. Mahan. Yes. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Unanimous vote. Great. Thank you very much, Ms. Delay. And I look forward to working with you and in, in, in the tea throughout the fall. Thank you so much. Okay. My pleasure. Sure. Okay, so I just want to have an announcement. Um, you're not doing as great as I had hoped on the, uh, the agenda this evening for timing. So what, um, just for people who are watching, people who may be in the waiting room, we're going to take item five now. After item five, I'm going to ask if the board will take item 17 and 18 out of order. That's the welcome to Dr. Holman and the AHS building project. Um, but right now, let's move on to the, to the net zero action plan. Item five, um, Ken Pruitt, Energy Manager, and, and Jenny Wright, Director of Planning and Community Development. Um, good evening, Ms. Wright. Good evening, Mr. Pruitt. Good evening. Good evening. We have a PowerPoint presentation for this evening. Great. And do we have that? Uh, uh, Ms. Yep, here we go, Mr. Checkpoint. Thank you. Great. Well, I'm going to take a brief amount of time just to give you an introduction to the Arlington Net Zero Action Plan, which many of you, it sounds like, are very familiar with uh, based on the last conversation, which is very exciting. Um, love all the references to a clean future. Um, so if you could go to the next slide. It's no secret that Arlington has a long history of greenhouse gas mitigation efforts um, through a variety of initiatives, plans, um, campaigns, um, et cetera. And the most recent of them actually originated with the select board when in 2018, you authorized joining the Metro Mayor's Coalition and committed to net zero by 2050, which led to the creation of the Clean Energy Future Committee, which Diane Mahan now serves on and previously Dan Dunn had served on and helped us to lead into the development of the net zero action plan, which obviously we're here to talk about tonight. Um, one important measure or effort uh, that relates to our mitigation efforts is the hiring of a clean energy manager, which initially was, I believe, a regional energy manager. So it was somebody who covered multiple communities, but um, the great um, efforts that were happening in Arlington really required a full-time individual to do the work. And so uh, the town invested in the creation of that full-time position. And of course, that is uh, Ken Pruitt today. Um, and uh, the last of them, or the, another more recent thing, uh, aside from whatever happens tonight with the Net Zero Action Plan, 
is that recently the town filed a home rule petition to ramp up decarbonization in new and substantially rehabbed buildings uh, related to the uh, reduction of fossil fuels in those buildings. So I think that that's a really great um, example of the kind of effort that we're talking about. And you know, I think with, with any plan, um, but particularly this one, this one requires three things. The first of them is will. It's gonna take a very strong will in order to accomplish a lot of the goals in this plan. You'll see things in the plan that are obviously very centrally all, all about Arlington, but a number of other things relate to stronger will that go well beyond the town. Um, and so that leads to the, the second item, which is advocacy. We're gonna have a lot of advocacy efforts to uh, leverage what we're doing here in Arlington, but to encourage it happening beyond. Um, and then the next thing is partnerships. You can go to the next slide, thank you. Um, and the partnerships um, relate back to, in many ways, the Clean Energy Future Committee. And many of the people who serve on this committee, including the smiling faces on the screen, um, there are people who have uh, relationships with many organizations in the community, um, statewide organizations are working collaboratively with other municipalities, working with our legislative delegation. It, it, the list goes on in terms of leveraging the talent and the partnerships to make everything happen. Um, and uh, if you go to the next slide, that led to the pushing forward with the Net Zero Action Plan project, which was funded by the Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs and a town match of time and resources. Um, we also received technical, technical support from the Metropolitan Area Planning Council, MAPC. And when we received the funding, it was actually to do two things. The first one is to, was to develop a net zero playbook, which essentially is this great compendium, um, an online, uh, actually available online, um, that showcases the various types of best practices and ideas around net zero. Um, the second part to it was to work with Arlington, Natick, and Melrose to develop these more uh, specific and prescriptive plans into the future, which is what we did. And it started in June of 2019, and it was completed back in February. Next slide, please. Um, so the Net Zero Action Plan had a lot of engagement, despite the fact that most of it took place during the pandemic um, in the last year. We focused really as closely as we could on centering equity in this planning process. We also conducted a survey. We held a net zero virtual open house in November, which was a really interesting interactive process. Um, and we made a lot of presentations uh, along the way, which was not just uh, talking to people, but talking with people about a lot of the ideas that ended up evolving and became the, the crux of this plan. So that included various groups in town, as well as the, the traditional town uh, bodies. Next slide, please. And so the plan itself has uh, essentially four components. The first is really inspirational and sort of aspirational, I would say, and a little bit creative and fun. Uh, that's the letter from the future, which is how we hope it will be in the future, in 2050, of course. Um, then it's getting to net zero, which talks about the background of the plan and the overarching goals. The net zero action roadmap is really the, the meat of the planning document, which outlines 31 greenhouse gas mitigation measures that are based off of uh, some really great data and research that we're planning to update on an ongoing, ongoing basis in the future. And then lastly, some very specific implementation tables that provide key details on all of the measures that are outlined um, in the roadmap. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Ken, who is going to outline a little bit more about that uh, foundational data uh, component, as well as the plan itself. Thank you. Thanks so much. What a great setup, Jenny, for um, where we've been and where we are now. And just a little bit more about that. First of all, it's a delight to be speaking to the select board tonight. Um, so we we did and as part of this project we completed a greenhouse gas inventory with data from calendar year 2017 so this represents greenhouse gas emissions in the year 2017 from arlington um, total of 284,078 metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent it really was most you know almost entirely carbon dioxide but some methane, some nitrous oxide, um, 
and then all normalized back to a carbon dioxide equivalent. That, um, that translates to a, a bit more than six tons of CO2 equivalent emissions in that one year from every single resident of Arlington. It's quite a bit of, um, quite a bit of greenhouse gases are, emit, are emitted from a variety of sources. Um, and I'll mention what they were. As you can see on, um, on the left, uh, stationary energy, um, which was almost 62% of greenhouse gas emissions in Arlington, refers almost exclusively to buildings, so heating and electricity um, for buildings, whereas transportation is almost 36% of greenhouse gas emissions. You see this through um, you know, the vast majority of Massachusetts communities. It's buildings and transportation that are um, emitting the greenhouse gases um, uh, of note. Um, on the right side, you can see a little bit of a further breakdown. Um, residential buildings um, account for the vast majority of greenhouse gas emissions with commercial and industrial um, quite a bit smaller. And then on transportation, um, it's, almost, it's almost all passenger vehicles causing the trans, uh, transportation related emissions. And that's you know, mostly uh, gasoline with some, with some diesel uh, in there as well. Uh, we're going to update this inventory periodically. Um, fortunately, the tool that we developed, uh, well, it was really MAPC that developed it with uh, consultation with Arlington, Natick, and Melrose, is easy enough that we can actually update it ourselves in-house. We don't have to hire consultants each time we want to update our greenhouse gas inventory. So uh, we want to do that at least uh, once every five years. More frequent than that might not make sense because uh, there's some variation year to year in emissions. But uh, next slide, please. So um, the, the plan is broken down into uh, three sections and, the, and these are really uh, essentially all greenhouse gas emissions from the town coming from buildings, coming from mobility or transportation and um, uh, our energy supply um, is, is the third, which is primarily, um, primarily uh, focused on electricity, but, but well, I, I won't say primarily, it's, but it's focused on electricity and, and heating um, fuels. The goal of this plan um, is, is to get us on a path to net zero. Um, there was discussion about whether the 31 measures in this plan by themselves would actually eliminate greenhouse gases by 2050. And um, the, the Clean Energy Future Committee is uh, an amazing committee of terrific people um, with a tremendous amount of talent and insight but um, we did the best we could and this, it'll only get us so far because we will need new technologies. We'll need reductions in costs for certain technologies. We'll need new federal and state laws uh, really for any community um, to get to net zero. But I think Arlington is, is quite a bit out front with this plan and we are gonna be well on our way to net zero by implementing these 31 measures. Uh, next slide, please. So this, this slide is key. It, it gives the, a framework for understanding everything in the plan, essentially. Um, certain, uh, there's essentially three pillars um, to reducing greenhouse gas emissions down to net zero. One is to maximize uh, energy efficiency, especially of buildings, make them as insulated as possible, as airtight as possible, so that they don't need that much energy to, uh, to be cooled and heated and um, for plug loads and lights. The next, um, the, the next pillar is to electrify everything. Um, Director Rate mentioned the home rule petition that we have in front of the legislature at present to uh, where we're requesting the ability to restrict fossil fuel heating um, in new buildings and major construction. Uh, that goes back to this key pillar. Um, we want all energy use in town to be through, um, through electricity. And the reason that's so important is we are steadily greening the grid. We will get to a point where all electricity is carbon free. It's almost 50% carbon free right now. Um, and it is getting, um, it, it, that's increasing by 2% per year based on uh, the next generation roadmap bill um, signed into law by the governor in March. That's gonna increase to 3% per year starting in 2025. So our grid is greening 
in general for everyone in Massachusetts, but especially in Arlington because we have um, Arlington Community Electricity, you see the acronym ACE there. Our local um, electricity program adds an additional 11% um, for everyone uh, of renewable energy to uh, the electricity supply for homeowners and businesses. And then on top of that, um, uh, Arlington residents and small businesses can, up, can uh, opt up to either 50% or even 100% clean electricity. Uh, quick advertisement there, go to aceace.arlingtonma.gov and it will take you less than five minutes to sign up to for 50 or 100% clean electricity. Uh, and again, the, the importance of electrifying everything and supplying that electricity with uh, clean electricity is, is paramount. Um, okay, and so if you, keep, if you keep those three pillars in mind, essentially any measure in the net zero plan will make sense and fall into those categories. So next slide, please. I mentioned there are 31 measures in the plan, mostly in buildings, followed by mobility, followed by energy. Um, we paid so much attention to buildings because 62% of our of our greenhouse gas emissions impact come from buildings, 36% from transportation, and then um, our clean energy supply measures uh, come in last. But even though they're few in number, they're critically important because we have to green our electricity supply. Next slide, please. And I believe this is actually the last slide. Uh, my apologies for there being so many words on the same slide, um, but uh, you know, uh, Director Rate mentions um, what it's going to take to implement the plan, and she mentioned she mentioned will and advocacy and partnerships. And um, as we discussed within the CEFC finalizing this plan, um, that was actually the easy part. The hard part is implementing the plan. Um, and so there, there's no way we could undertake or even initiate 31 measures in any given year. So the, the Clean Energy Future Committee selected 10 measures um, to initiate this year, leaving the remaining 21 measures for um, subsequent years. Uh, three of those measures at the top are for uh, what we're calling the Electrify Arlington campaign, which is a campaign, an accompanying website, and promotion of EVs. Um, you won't be surprised to, that we're talking about electrification as a measure to implement, given the importance of electrification um, in the net zero plan itself, as I mentioned. The idea here is that um, this, the concept of electrification is new to most people. Um, even if it's not new, uh, executing on it is fairly complex. So we want to have uh, a website that's one-stop shopping with uh, clear information for everyone who wants it, as well as uh, in terms of the campaign, uh, we want to uh, train up uh, local volunteers to have uh, basic knowledge on electrification and you can kind of act as uh, a concierge for a homeowner who wants to understand the basics of what to do and get part of the way there before being handed off to a true expert or in fact um, an installer of heat pumps or solar or that, or that type of thing. Similarly, uh, electric vehicles uh, are here, they're here to stay but they're still new to most people. So we wanna have the uh, really clear, good information and people who can help disseminate that information. So this is kind of similar to the Heat Smart campaign that we ran in 2019, except much bigger, we hope, um, and over a long, longer time period. Uh, the fourth measure is to advocate for uh, a net zero stretch energy code at the state level. It's something that, that we're already doing. Um, fortunately, uh, it was made part of the Next Generation Climate Roadmap Bill uh, passed by the legislature that I mentioned earlier. And so um, that code is under development. Um, we simply need advocates um, and municipalities simply need to make sure that it is uh, truly a net zero code and not something uh, watered down that doesn't, doesn't get there. Um, we uh, decided to study uh, the feasibility of commercial property assessed clean energy or CPACE, something that we're now doing within, our, within the Department of Planning and Community Development. Um, it's essentially a finance, financing mechanism for expensive uh, energy efficiency and renewable energy upgrades at, at commercial properties. Uh, we decided to continue and, and expand participation in the Green Communities Program and similar programs. We're already, of course, a green community and participating in the Green Communities Program. But um, as the state uh, takes more and more decisive action against climate change, 
we think and have already seen that there will be more and more grant programs uh, available um, and technical assistance programs for communities that want to lead on climate um, as Arlington has um, for so long. The uh, seventh measure is to support implementation of Connect Arlington. I think, uh, I think this board voted to endorse that plan uh, at its last meeting. Um, what's even much, much better than driving an electric vehicle is to uh, make your trip uh, by foot or bicycle or uh, on mass transit. And so um, the, the top mobility recommendation coming out of the Clean Energy Future Committee is to robustly support implementation of the Connect Arlington Sustainable Transportation Plan. Uh, the eighth measure was to adopt a zero emissions municipal fleet policy or plan, um, um, as Ms. Mahan uh, mentioned, and that is something that we are uh, starting to look at. Other communities are looking at that. Some, uh, some, some municipal fleet vehicles are easy to electrify. We've already done that with several. Um, others are harder, especially police uh, cruisers that are running three shifts. There's no time to park them and charge them, for example. But I am uh, pleased to say, as I think uh, many of you know, that uh, we will be adding uh, two fully electric uh, buses to the Arlington Public School fleet um, over the next 12 months through a couple of grants um, that uh, our department has won. And so two out of 12 will be electric and we'll we're not, not going to look back, going to keep heading in that direction, hopefully uh, supported by grant funding. The ninth measure to advocate for improved utility rates for EV charging. Um, this is kind of an esoteric measure that I'll, I'll basically just say um, uh, the, the electricity cost um, for charging electric vehicles rapidly um, through what are, what's known as DC fast uh, charging. Um, can be prohibitively ex expensive um, with Eversource's current rates. And so um, we are advocating for those rates to be modified specifically for um, EV charging at, at that DC fast level. Um, and um, finally, um, the, a, a goal that we are starting to work on now is this goal of increasing the uh, Arlington Community Electricity or ACE default rate of renewable electricity to 100% by 2030. So you wouldn't need to opt up to 100%. You would be at 100% automatically um, by 2030. Um, it's a challenge. We're looking at it. Um, uh, the town manager has been uh, a real leader on the ACE program. And um, if anyone can help us figure it out, I'm sure he can. Um, so uh, these 10 measures, again, are just the start. Um, we're going to evaluate priorities. Um, annually, the CEFC will, um, and decide which measures to continue, which we've essentially completed, uh, which to delay. Um, and then um, perhaps every five years, um, we'll look at the whole plan and decide if we essentially need a new plan, sort of a major upgrade. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there will need to be changes in technology, um, changes in state and federal law, decrease in, in cost of some of um, the technologies um, for Arlington to truly reach net zero. And I think we'll need to update the plan periodically to, to capture those changes in laws and, and, and technology and cost. And with that, why don't I stop and uh, see if, uh, if you have questions. Great, thank you, Mr. Pruitt. Um, I'll start with the board uh, with uh, Mrs. Mahan. <clears throat> Excuse me, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and surprisingly enough, I'm really not going to have any questions, uh, only because I, I do have the opportunity and benefit of sitting on the Clean Energy Future uh, Committee um, with uh, Ms. Ray and Mr. Pruitt and a whole bunch of other groups, mothers out front. And I do want to put a shout out for uh, Daniel Amstutz, who I'm always amazed by how much we work him. Every time we turn around, I mean, I think I see him not even joking at meetings in Zoom more than my husband um, because he's in transportation, he's in the Clean Energy Futures Committee, um, he's at the select board meeting. Um, so uh, with that, I will just make a motion to receive and leave it to my colleagues for any questions or follow-up they might have. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Mahan. Mr. Chapdelay? Did you... Yeah, Mr. Chair, if you um, don't mind, we, we were hoping the board would consider uh, a motion of endorsement tonight, like the Connect Arlington plan. Um, 
if Mrs. Mahan would be willing to consider. No, move, move to endorse. I was just, I'm, um, no, and it isn't the, for me when I <clears throat> see that someone's looking for something more than um, receipt, and it's been on previous uh, wording. When it says for approval, that means you just don't want the receipt. So just not that anyone has to do that, but so no problem. Move to endorse. Thank you. Great. Okay. Thank you, Mrs. Mahan. Mr. Diggins. I will happily second it, and 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 I am thrilled to um, see um, Ms. Rain and Mr. Pruitt here. Um, I'm with us, you know, but I surprised me. I don't have the same tone as I did with Ms. Delay because I was surprised, but I was expecting you to, but um, it's great to see you. And uh, yeah, this is, uh, you packed a lot in the 30 pages, I mean, uh, uh, and so I, I'm really impressed and I like what I see and I read and I feel as if the select board uh, has its marching orders uh, with respect to a lot of the stuff that can be done with buildings, you know, uh, I think it's an opportunity for us to work with the ARB and to, maybe get some zoning articles uh, in um, some upcoming uh, town meetings. So uh, if not the select board, then certainly some people in town that I um, associate with me. Uh, in fact, yesterday at one of the um, um, meeting in the box meetings. You know? So uh, if they're listening, so um, I think um, we have a lot to work with here and, and can accomplish some things. Uh, uh, with respect to that letter in the beginning, I, I liked it. And uh, if I may predict, you know, two of the um, governors from Arlington would be um, Cindy Friedman um, and maybe um, Sean Garbley or um, David Swanson. You know, just, just, just putting that out there. Uh, and um, so um, the other, uh, something else I might suggest um, that we think about is um, that there's this transportation climate initiative uh, that uh, the state, I am pretty sure is gonna join and that will perhaps um, give us some funding uh, for some things that we can do in transportation. So that may be, be some funds available to us, hopefully in the next year or two. So just want to put that out there. And also, I think we're going to discuss um, uh, the liaison to the um, meetings, I mean, how we're going to meet, um, potentially um, hybrid meetings. And so I'd like um, maybe someone to think about the how, how energy is expended I mean, I, we have our hypotheses or our thoughts about I me, mean, what's more efficient, I me, mean, but it'd be good to have back that up with something. So maybe calling on you, Mr. Pruitt, for some um, advice about that, or maybe someone that you can point us to for some insights about that. And, and, um, and along the lines of um, things that maybe you'll do later, I, mean, I thought CES4, the one about uh, neighborhoods, neighborhood heat pumps, was exciting, you know, uh, and what I like about that is that it gives a, another hook um, into um, community engagement, um, because I think one of the best ways to get people to do civic engagement is not to say you should do civic engagement because, well, it's a good thing to do, but have them kind of engage with each other, meeting and almost clandestinely we do the civic engagement thing. And I think that's a, a way that would benefit the environment and, and the community. So, so, um, I'm going to stop there and just end with um, uh, there was on page 10, uh, there's a letter on page 10, another letter uh, where uh, it was almost as if it was written by me because the person uh, talked about uh, connected autonomous vehicles. I just want to say it wasn't me, but I really like that idea. I think it has a lot of potential. So I want to work on that. So thank you once again. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. Um, Mr. Helmuth. Thank you. Um, I echo my colleagues' appreciation to the Human Clean Energy Futures Committee and the, the Department of Planning and Community Development for this, this outstanding work. It's a terrific report. And, uh, and, and thank you, Mr. Pruitt, for shout, the shout out to, to, to ACE. I'm going to do another one, ace.arlingtonmath.gov. Arlingtonma.gov. I, I have to say, uh, when, when uh, my household signed up for the 100% renewable. It was really quick. It was really easy. It was also not nearly as expensive as I thought it would be. And I would encourage everybody to go take a look at that. Another thing you can do at ace.arlingtonmad.gov is request a lot sign to share the word and the opportunity with your neighbors and help us get the word out about something that we all can do individually or many of us can do individually um, to act locally and like to act individually because that's uh, clearly, as, uh, as Mr. Pruitt explained so well, 
a big part of the solution. So thank you again for this. Uh, Len's right, these are our marching orders. Ms. Rates right that this will require considerable will. I would add that it will also require foresight. It will require us to think long. And that's really hard to do in, as, as, a, as a society and in, and in government because there are so many short-term considerations and, and things. But again, as I mentioned earlier, in the news right now, the UN's climate change experts are telling us the world is on fire. And you know, the pandemic has commented our intention, but the climate is still an emergency. This is the generational challenge. And I'm really excited at Arlington's leadership. And I'm excited to have this roadmap and these toolkits to do our part. And I especially excited to be part of a select board and of a town administration that is absolutely committed to doing that, to making some hard choices, making some long-term investments that are essential to our survival and to the world being the world that we want it to be uh, for future generations. So, so thank you all for that. Thank you, Mr. Helmuth. Mr. Hurd. Thank you, and again, I echo my colleagues comments and thank you for the presentation. I also didn't see a news report today that said that climate change is actually more dangerous and catastrophic than previously thought, where as we knew that it was a catastrophic end, it, the thought that it's more dangerous than we knew is really scary. And essentially the window to for action is closing. And so we're lucky to live in a municip municipality and a state that recognizes this and has done really incredible efforts to fight climate change, but there's a lot of work to be done. And I think this plan addresses that and I'm happy to endorse it. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. And I'm also happy to endorse this plan with my colleagues. I wanna thank you both um, for all the work that, that you've done. And, and I do wanna commend you as well, Mr. Pruitt for the uh, product placement. And we may have to work on getting a banner across uh, some of our uh, presentations, but uh, well said. and. and placed in there very nicely. Um, so I, I thank you for that. Um, with a motion to endorse by Mrs. Mahan and a second by Mr. Diggins, Attorney Hine. Heard? Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Helmet. Yes. Mrs. Mahan. Yes. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. It's an unanimous vote. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. Good evening. Okay. Good evening and good night. All right. Um, so as I said earlier, I'd, I'd like to take items 17 and 18 out of order. Uh, item 17 is a welcome to Dr. Elizabeth Homan, the new superintendent of the Arlington Public Schools. And then we will follow that with the Arlington High School Building Project presentation. Uh, Dr. Homan, good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Yeah, sorry about the delay here in, in, in getting to you. Um, no worries. But I, I want to welcome you officially to, to Arlington. We had the pleasure of meeting at the reception at, at Town Hall uh, recently. And uh, you started on July 1. And uh, we're really looking forward to, to your leadership with the, with the schools and, and working with you going forward. So mm -hmm. if you have a, a few words to say, and I, I guess before I turn it over to you, what better person to hit the ground running than someone who's completed multiple marathons <laughs> across the country. So um, thank you for, for being here with us tonight and best of luck in your new position as superintendent. Thank you. Um, yes, I'm not uh, doing a whole lot of marathoning right, right these days, but um, yes, we have certainly hit the ground running in the school district. Um, I have been in the job now for officially for a month and about seven days. And we've been very busy. We're planning for the fall return and making sure that all of our students get back to school safe. And I'm very much looking forward this week to having some updates for families on what that might look like. Um, I will say I've been um, receiving such a warm welcome in Arlington and it's been very clear to me since I got here that I am now working in a very innovative and progressive community as evidenced by the presentation we just saw and the one that we're about to see. Um, 
And that's really exciting for me. And it's obviously also a community that's very dedicated to education. I've had the opportunity to meet with families in several listening sessions this summer already, um, with staff in some listening sessions. And um, the next part, which I'm probably the most excited about, is getting into some classrooms and meeting all of the kids. So that will be my focus for the first month or so of school, is getting out into our schools and into the classrooms with the principals um, and other leaders to see what's going on uh, in instruction. I have an entry plan that is very focused on doing a lot of listening over the next few months. Um, I will report to the school committee on the findings of that entry plan in January. Um, and I'm really looking forward to the start of the school year and getting all of our kids back into school full time in person as safely as possible. That's really what we're sort of laser focused on right now. Um, it's been very nice to meet most of you. I've had the opportunity to meet most of you. And if I haven't yet, we have something on the books. Um, and I'm, I'm very happy to be here in Arlington. It's clearly an excellent fit for me and my values. And it's been wonderful to be meeting folks and collaborating with our incredibly intelligent teams, both on the school side and on the town side. Great, thank you very much. I'm just turning it to the board for any uh, brief comments, Mr. Helmut. It was great to meet you at the reception. Really glad to have you. And uh, thank you again for, for coming to Arlington. Thank you. Mr. Diggins. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I wasn't able to get to the reception, but you were uh, nice enough to meet me for coffee uh, last last Tuesday morning. And it was a really good conversation. And, and I am still uh, buzzy from the fact that you are more, you see more potential in youth civic engagement than I do. You know? <laughs> and so I'm very hopeful about it, but I, I tend to be pragmatic about these things, at least I think I am, but but you see more potential there and that just drives me to want to do it more. So thank you for um, um, being our superintendent and, and, and being a part of Arlington. Great. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. Mr. Hurd. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Holman. Um, mm -hmm. I also got an opportunity to meet you at the reception and it was great getting, getting to talk to you for a little bit. I have, as I mentioned to you, a incoming first grader and third grader at uh, Dallin. Dallin. So we're yep, good memory. <laughs> so, so we're excited. And, you know, we, like I said, we've been really thankful and appreciative to all the efforts so far from the Arlington Public School System in a really trying time. And um, I did enjoy talking with you and hearing some of your ideas and your energy for the job. So I look forward to it. It's going to be a difficult first few years, which you know, but I certainly think you're up to the task and look forward to working with you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Mrs. Mahan. <clears throat> Hello, Dr. Holman, or when we meet Liz, <laughs> she always <laughs> have a hollow correspondence. Call me Liz, call me Liz. But uh, you definitely have the credentials and education um, that Arlington is so grateful for. Um, and I, I look forward to talking to you about just how, because you're a captive audience, um, perhaps two, three years down the road. And um, the only one time we pulled it off, I believe uh, Mr. Thielman may have been on uh, the school committee. I'm, I can't remember. Um, is it, I'd like to both committees and um, boards think about in like 23, 24, putting aside anytime we have a debt exclusion or override, maybe once a year, maybe once every two years, um, we have some sort of meeting or whatever is a good word to call it. Because one of the things that I've seen in the town is there's a town side and the school side. And I'd like to see that mesh more. more. I'm not looking for a new word that we all fall under, but um, I, I think if that would be helpful to me. And then, um, the other thing I would say, just as a word of advice, um, but you certainly have the endurance, the expertise, the credentials, um, whether any decision, big or small, um, I would say something you already know, you have a great resource with your school committee and its members. I know um, if you don't know it, you're gonna do your homework and, and due diligence and check it one more time again. And I would just say, once you make that decision, um, not that you ever would, but what's always been successful to me is, yes, you keep an open mind, but um, you see that decision out. And, you know, you can kind of tweak it along the way. 
So I'm really excited that you're here. I'm super stoked, except for we didn't get to see Fasco. That's the next phase, uh, the tours that, that were offered. And I know we're gonna talk that in, in the next agenda item. So welcome to Arlington. I look so forward to uh, working with you, working for you. I'm here as a resource and um, hopefully see you soon in the near future. Thank you, Thank Mr. You. Chairman. Thank you, Mrs. Mahan. Um, okay, and I'm going to move right on to item 18, which is the AHS building project presentation to be led by Jeff Thielman, the chair of the AHS building committee. Just before I turn it over to you, Jeff, I do want to thank you for setting up the tour. The four out of uh, four of us got to see the um, new high school last week. It's very exciting, and you know we'll have some comments on it after that. But I want to turn the floor over to you and um, really look forward to the presentation tonight. Thanks very much, uh, Steve. Thanks to the uh, board for inviting uh, the, the building committee to tonight's presentation. As I, you already heard, you were, we're here with Dr. Holman, Jim Burroughs uh, from Skanska is here, Lori Coles from HMFH, architectural firm. Jim Burroughs represents the owner's project manager. Uh, we have a slide presentation. I'm gonna run through it. I wanna thank all of you or four of you for taking the time to visit the high school. We are very proud of uh, what we're building uh, with the money of the taxpayers and uh, we'll make it available to other people. And uh, Mr. Diggins, if you wanna visit, just email me and uh, we'll, we'll, make that, we'll make a visit happen with uh, Jim Burroughs and the staff. So uh, I hope you all had a great tour. I heard good things about it. I heard several other people in the, in the uh, town leadership were there. So um, let's get to it. Um, the building committee, I guess if you go to the next slide, there you go. The building committee is pleased to report that the project is on budget and basically on schedule. The total cost is $289.8 million with approximately 84.6 million coming from the Massachusetts School Building Authority uh, or the MSBA. The school is designed, uh, as all of you know, for 1,755 students, but it can serve more than that if necessary. Um, I wanna make a special note about the current grant amount from the MSBA after the town locked in lower construction costs from strong bids, the MSBA lowered its grant accordingly. The MSBA also made adjustments based on some design changes that we approved as a committee and the grant is reduced by uh, one point, about, about $1.4 million. Our bid savings are about a half a million dollars for an overall town cost increase of $880,000 um, and this could be lower if we don't need to spend all of the project budget. So let's go to the next slide. <clears throat> we have many partners in the project, some of whom are here tonight, HMFH Architects, Skanska, the MSBA, and then our contractor, Consigli Construction. Um, as you can see from the, this next slide, the process started in 2016, and it will continue until the building is completed in 2024 with final site work, including fields and lights scheduled for the spring of 2025. The opening of phase one, which is the science, technology, engineering, art, and mathematics wing, the wing you, you all walked through uh, last week and the performing arts wings will be right after the February break of 2022, which is not that far away with an, uh, the auditorium being ready for students in uh, early April of 2022. Uh, the next slide, please. The detailed <clears throat> design phase of the project began in 2019. And during this phase, the building committee with guidance from the design team refined and finalized the building and site design. If you go to the next slide, you'll see the, uh, the final design of the Mass Ave entrance. And if you go to the next slide, uh, slide you'll see the final design of the athletic field entrance uh, behind the school. And the next slide, um, I just wanna to touch on value engineering. Uh, we are very mindful as a committee. We have a diverse committee of people of, uh, many different perspectives from all over the community uh, and from town government. Um, uh, we are charged with doing value engineering throughout the project. Um, and, you know, always looking for ways to save the taxpayers, both state taxpayers and local taxpayers money. As part of the design process, multiple estimates were performed and compared to the budget. Value engineering is the process of making modifications to the original design in order to meet the budget while maintaining our educational goals and priorities. At various points in time, items were removed from the project. And later when some bids came back lower than anticipated, we were able to add some items back. 
At the next slide, uh, this gives you an overview of our value engineering work, several items, the artificial turf lighting, the Minuteman bikeway ramp and the Millbrook Drive traffic light remain in the project. Additionally, in response to COVID-19, the building committee voted uh, to add HVAC ventilation and air filtration improvements. And finally, <clears throat> we made the decision to remove the ramp connecting Mass Ave to the athletic fields and we modified some interior and uh, exterior facilities. <clears throat> uh, in the next slide, I won't, in the interest of time, I'm not gonna go into the details, but I think all of you on the select board know that we renovated the Parmenter School as part of this project in order to accommodate the Monotomy Preschool during construction. And the result when the uh, middle, uh, Monotomy, middle, uh, Monotomy Preschool moves back into the high school will be a building that can be used, uh, can be leased uh, to others uh, and, and bring in revenue for the town. The next slide, uh, you'll get a sense of the Par Mentor project. And then the next slide, uh, you'll see the entrance of the Par Mentor. We go to the next slide. Um, I do wanna, this has been raised in, in many public meetings and many public conversations with people. Our contractors and subcontractors contractors have carefully followed COVID-19 protocols since March of 2020. Uh, there are numerous safety measures in place. The construction crew takes this very seriously. Uh, the men and women on the job uh, are, have safety uh, uh, checks every day uh, and have been very careful and we've had a good track record there. Um, as you can see in the next slide, you're gonna get an October, this is October of 2020, before we began work, not that long ago, uh, when you think of how quickly we're moving, not that long ago, that's an aerial view of, of the school. Um, and then uh, if you go to the next slide, if you look closely in November, you'll see a white, we, we, we put up the first, what we call the first beam. Um, you'll see a white steel beam with the letters AHS on it. Uh, this beam was the first steel raised uh, and it was, a, it was an exciting, it was a rainy day, but it was an exciting day in November to be out there with the construction crew. Uh, the whole crew was just excited to get the project going and some of us in the building committee were there as well. And the next slide, <clears throat> um, You'll see that in December of 2020, the town of Arlington and our construction management firm, Consigli Construction, signed a guaranteed maximum price or GMP agreement that sets the maximum price that the town will have to pay for the project, regardless of the actual cost incurred. The combination of a competitive bidding process and pandemic related changes in the economy in 2020 resulted in approximately $1 million in savings. If you look at the next <clears throat> slide, you'll see that we're exceeding our original sustainability estimates. The sustainability features of the, new, of the new school support a long standing commitment to reduce energy use across all town facilities and operations. That kind of aligns with the conversation we heard earlier. And we're on track to achieve LEED gold, that's leadership in energy and environmental design, LEED gold status. And the next uh, slide is planned. There will be four phases of construction in order to build uh, the school on the existing site and the phasing minimizes disruption of student learning and eliminates the need for modular classrooms. The project has been designed to accommodate the school in operation. We have precautions in place that keep staff and students safe and away from the construction area. The working relationship, I can, I can attest this after many, many meetings with our construction leadership and school officials, the working relationship between Dr. Janger, his staff and the project team has been excellent. There is a monthly indoor quality assessment done as well as regular dust monitoring reports. I wanna note that the return to students at the end of last year, at the end of the 20, 2021 school year was executed very successfully and we are ready for the safe return of students to school in just four weeks. <clears throat> the next slide, uh, you'll see uh, the four phases of the project in uh, more detail. As I mentioned earlier, phase one will extend to February of 2022. And let me move to the next slide. This is a view of the, of the current uh, look at the front entrance of the school compared, compared to the finished design. So you see that uh, coming together. And the next slide is a view of uh, the entrance uh, to the performing arts wing. Um, <clears throat> and then the next slide uh, is a picture of our auditorium, which will be spectacular. And the next slide has another view. I think it has another view of the auditorium. Yes, it does. Um, and the next slide has uh, a look at the uh, interior of uh, one of our classrooms. And uh, <clears throat> the next slide um, is a view of the progress that we're making in the steam wing. Um, 
And uh, the next slide, um, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, this, this is, yeah, the next slide. And that, that's a view of, um, of the light well. And then the next slide is an aerial view of the project uh, in, uh, uh, from last month. So <clears throat> the final slide lists uh, the members, there's another view of the project, the list the members of the building committee. Um, I do wanna say that, you know, for the past, since 2015, since we started this conversation, we were led by Dr. Kathleen Bode, who retired on June 30th. Um, we're grateful to, she and uh, Dr. Holman are, are still in touch talking uh, uh, as needed. Uh, but uh, Kathy Bodie was uh, instrumental in getting this project uh, to this point and a huge part of our effort uh, and a big part of our committee. But there you can see the members of the committee. The committee has been working closely together since the end of 2016. It's almost five years together. Uh, we know each other well, we trust one another, and I think we've made uh, some very good decisions on behalf of the community. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna close by inviting the public to visit our website, sign up for weekly, weekly construction uh, updates and follow us on video and uh, Facebook. We believe we're, uh, that this new school rising in the middle of our community will give everyone uh, in Arlington or is giving everyone in Arlington hope for a better and a brighter future. So we thank you for listening. Uh, Mr. DeCourcy said uh, to keep it as brief as possible. I tried to do that. That gives you a brief overview of where, where we're at. And Lori, Jim, Adam is on the committee as well. All of us uh, can take any questions that you might have about the project. Great. Th 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 thank you, Mr. Thielman. You went above and beyond. <laughs> That's I, um, you know, I got a you know, I got a timeline. I, I got the me I got the memo. <clears throat> instructions from the chair. Yeah. Okay, yeah. no, th 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 thank you very much. Um, so I wanna turn it over to board members for, for questions and comments and I will start with Mrs. Mahan. Well, unfortunately, Mr. Chairman, I didn't get your memo, but, but I will start, try to be brief. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> thank you, my colleague, Mr. Thielman, Jeff, um, oh, okay. uh, for arranging those uh, tours of the high school. I was itching like crazy to get in there. I have been down on the sidewalk, haven't gotten further in. Um, know a few people have a relative that's working on the site, but you know, I waited my turn. And I just wanna say, I am so impressed uh, when we toured the building, um, it, you know, everybody comes into the building looking uh, different ways. First of all, the whole, I was there for 56 minutes. I wish I could stay longer, but I saw literally one nail and it was next to a box. I saw all the rooms swept nice and clean. I saw on every floor, I asked, because I didn't see it initially, but once uh, someone from Consiglio or, or whoever it was, I apologize, pointed out where the um, fire hazmat stations were for the workers. And there's three on every floor. Um, I saw only one piece of cra craft equipment that actually had a padlock and a, a, a chain on it. And there's been no craft theft. And I say that because when you bring together doing a project like that, because I come from those roots, um, you know, everyone in the construction industry knows about recent Worcester project. And it's those things when you're talking about um, worker safety, um, when you, you're talking about what you're gonna get in the end as a finished pro project, um, as well as I could tell that, um, and I, I can't remember the gentleman's name, but when I asked him about, do you have uh, safety meetings? When are they there in the morning? And, and then when I noted that, um, uh, the rooms that they're using for temporary storage, I could tell that the materials were placed with a craft order in mind, meaning the worst thing to me, a not organized project and not being done well. So you can have those cost savings and you can get the finished project you want is you go in and you see, you know, uh, the blue board or certain piping, it's way over in the back. And if, when I went into the two storage places that had all the materials, I could tell what they were working on at the time because literally the piles, you're like, okay, that's all the stuff that's at the end of this. So um, I definitely was impressed with that. So I run every piece of steel I looked at and I looked at a lot. There were calculations on there in pencil. Again, that's a testament to the projects. People always ask, they compare it to other school projects. Um, and in terms of uh, materials in COVID-19, there was only one uh, particular uh, uh, equipment that has been delayed for COVID, um, but 
we only have to wait three months out. I know construction sites that are waiting 12 to uh, 15 months because it's such, which again tells me that they're in contact with the um, industry. And the other thing, just from my early days with chalk lines being done manually, because everyone always asks about the high school and you know how it's done, it's laser now. So <laughs> you're gonna get that 100% right. And then the only thing that I just noted, and I know um, Lori and everybody was on top of it, but when we went into the arc space, I just saw plumbing for two sinks at the same height. Um, and I heard most of what Lori said, but in a big place like that, and not all my hearing on the left, um, I, I know she told me there's another sink coming in. I think you said it was a trough sink. And then that's what where, so we'd have four sinks and we wouldn't have a handicap. If you could just answer that question, because I just, I didn't want to make you keep repeating it. Yeah, Lori, go ahead, Diane, again. Lori, again. Diane, let me just say, no one has given that detail of an analysis of the building, nobody yet. <laughs> It's gone through the place. No one, not one elected appointed official in the town. Half of it, half of it. I'm not doing it. Right, right. I do it. Before Lori comments, I just want to say that um, I, I do want to I do want to recognize the members of the building committee that have been very careful in reviewing all the construction bids coming in for safety. So Frank Callahan from the Building Trades Association is on our on our committee. Uh, Judson Pierce, who is a, a workman's compensation attorney. Both of those fellows have gone through a lot of the bids and we've actually said no to some bids because of their track record. So we've been very, very focused on safety uh, and, and so COVID safety as well. Lori, you can answer that. <clears throat> the question from- Hi, thank Ryan. you all. Um, so yes, every, every room that has a sink has an accessible sink. And in the case of the art rooms, not only do we have the sinks on the perimeter that you saw, we have, um, and we are calling them trough sinks. It's not a very elegant word, but, but basically very deep sinks that the students can actually stand on on two different sides. So there are multiple, multiple faucets just to get, you know, at the end of the end of the class period when a whole bunch of kids need to get to sinks, it gives that many more um, uh, access points to water to clean up, so. Okay, thank you. It's just me going in every room and I see the plumbing, I see the HVAC done. I see the sprinkler and everything. And I just, I didn't see, like if I saw the pipes for that other one. So I just wanted to be a stickler. And I just want to make sure everybody knows like all members of the board or the school committee were definitely paying attention to everything because we appreciate the work that's being done and how it's being done. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. The building, the building is fully accessible, 100%. Uh, thank you, thank you, Mrs. Mahan. Uh, Mr. Hurd. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Jeff, for the presentation and all the work that you've done. I don't know if you knew, knew how much work you were undertaking when you took on the uh, chair of the building committee, but certainly uh, we appreciate all the efforts that you have there. Um, and thank you for arranging the tours. I The only thing I can say about the tour is just how impressed I was at the workmanship, the progress. I had given how short a time ago it was that it, we just saw the framing up. I expected to go in and see studs and we went in and there were rooms that they had started painting. So um, there's certainly a lot of progress being made in the layout just makes sense. Um, and particularly the arts area, the, the auditorium, all the performance, the even to, down to the individual practice rooms where students can go in and, pr and practice their instruments themselves to the chorus room and the band room. It's just, it was very impressive. And it's certainly exciting to have kids that will go through the system and eventually end up at Arlington High School and, and the all the facilities that they're gonna have at their disposal is really exciting for the town. And so thank you all for all your efforts. Great point, John. Yeah, and I just wanna say, I don't think people in the community or, or students realize yet how much bigger all the art labs are, the science labs, all those rooms. It's transformational, not just from a physical perspective, but from an educational perspective. It will it will transform the way we deliver education in that, in that school. Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Uh, Mr. Diggins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Are you expecting a motion of some sort for this? No, we, we just, well, we, we can receive the report. If you want to make a motion to receive, that's fine. But this was a, an informational presentation that we thought we were at a, a good point in the project to, to, to hear from the committee tonight. 
Okay. Well, if we don't need a motion, then we can save a vote and save a little time. You know, so, okay. um, you know, sometimes there's an inverse relationship between how much I say and the, de the degree to which I'm impressed. I mean, and this is going to be one of them, Mr. Thielman. You know, I would expect no less from you and the building committee and the, um, the school committee past and present. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lance. Very nice of you to say. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. Mr. Helmuth. Thank you, uh, Jeff. Thank you once again. I think every presentation I've seen you make on this has been concise, compelling, and just really clearly communicated what a great value the taxpayers are getting for, for their money. My tour of, this, of the school just reinforced that, the, the, the quality of it, the incredible, impressive progress. And, and most of all, that this is on schedule and on budget, given the huge disruptions from in the supply chain and everything else uh, from, the, from the pandemic just blows my mind in a, in a very good kind of way. And I think it just speaks to the quality of the leadership uh, from you, the committee, the entire project team. And you know, I just, I just couldn't be happier with that. The space itself really is transformative. That, that's the word that came to my mind. Um, the natural light pervades everywhere, which will pr provide a human experience, but also save on lighting. And, and there's so much thought put into this. Some of the, I can't wait for the public to see some of the, the, the discourse lab, the spaces, the, the interactive spaces for students outside the classroom to, to do small group work. Um, I was, of course, uh, overjoyed to see the size of the performing arts spaces because that, that rectifies like, one of the great injustices of the old building um, mm -hmm. and something that's near to my heart. But it's just all of that and more in spades. Um, and, you know, I think this is going to be a great resource for our students, for the communities, and, uh, and just kudos for that. And, and thanks again for the, for the tours and for coming to us tonight. Thank you, Eric. Those are kind words. Thanks very much. And we have we have a great design team. This, the the, the Skansk HMH, HMFH Consigli combination is, is pure gold. They do great work. So we're lucky. Great. Thank you, Mr. Helmuth. Yeah, and I, I want to, Ms. Coles and Mr. Burroughs are here tonight. I want to thank you both for the tours. Uh, they accompanied us and our, our day was, and we didn't have the detailed questions maybe that Mrs. Mahan had, but yeah, you answered every question and uh, I really appreciate it. And I think people are really going to be surprised at how much natural light there is in the building. And even, even with the, all the windows not put in and um, all the light walls not open, it, it's amazing um, how much thought got put into that and, and what a great learning environment is going to be created. And I, I do also want to uh, mention the, the, the D-Lab space, which uh, really looks phenomenal. It's going to be a highlight and, and um, it's a school building, but I'm, I'm hoping that we can have some community programs in, in that D-Lab as well to, uh, to show it off to the community. So I want to thank you for, for bringing us through, um, Jeff, for, for reaching out to us and, and um, accommodating our request for, the, for the, um, the tours because it really made a difference, really made us so proud to, to see what is coming on that site and, and what's ahead of us as a community and for our students. Thank you. And I, I just want to add uh, one thing. I, I, I want to recognize, I'm on, you know, we have a great committee. There's our communications uh, subcommittee led by Amy Spear, who I think might be watching tonight, uh, who helped out with the presentation, by the way. Nice of Eric to say good things about my presentations. I, I have Amy doing a lot of, she's really the brains behind this thing. Uh, but uh, our website um, and the transparency on the website, the communication on the website, really is an example. And we get emails and calls from people all over the state that want to replicate our, our website. So uh, and even, even Dr. Holman said, uh, you know, when, yeah, and you, when you came on board that this was a website to be uh, emulated. So uh, when you're speaking to the consti your constituents, all our constituents in Arlington, tell them to get on the website, get the information they need, ask questions, we'll get back to them. Um, we are very proud of the project. We're going to keep, it's been an interactive dialogue with the community over the past five years. That's going to continue. Um, we are uh, starting to talk about how do we get town meeting members. Uh, we've gotten uh, the leadership of the, we have the select board. We've gotten leadership of the town committees. Uh, school committee's been in there, the building committee. We're trying to figure out a way to organize tours for, uh, for town meeting members. And uh, we'll, so just stay tuned. We'll get that, we'll get that organized later in the, in the year. So we thank you. Also, I want to thank uh, Adam Chaplin. It's been dynamite, uh, and Sandy on the finance committee, keeping us uh, honest and focused. So we have a great group leading this project, and we are grateful for your support.
Great. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Thielen. And, and uh, keep up the great work. And, and we're really looking forward to the first part of the um, first phase opening in, in February uh, with the STEAM Wing and, and performing arts later in the academic year. So thank you all for being with us tonight. Sorry we're a little late getting to you, but uh, we appreciate the presentation. Our pleasure. All right, my friends. Thanks so much. Thanks for all your good work, everybody. Keep up the good work. You take care. Okay, you too. Thank you. Bye now. Bye now. Okay, um, so moving back to item six um, for approval, annual doc permit review, uh, Attorney Heim. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm gonna make this extremely brief. These are your regulations for um, something that doesn't affect a lot of people, but um, they're basically to approve floating docks in places like Spy Pond and the uh, Mystic Lakes. Um, there's only two changes that I'm asking uh, that the board make. One is that um, it explicitly authorized the conservation uh, planner, um, who's currently Emily Sullivan, uh, uh, to be your designee to administer this program. And secondly, I think this is a, a gimme, but I just want to make sure I brought it back to the board, is that we would change board of selectmen, which is currently reflected in the policy to select board. That's it. Okay. Thank you, Attorney Heim. Um, Mr. Helmuth. Thank you, move approval. Great, thank you. Uh, Mrs. Mahan? Um, I will second Mr. Helmuth's motion and ask uh, for a friendly amendment that um, we <clears throat> appoint Emily Sullivan as our designee. Is that okay? That, that, that's fine, yeah. Yes. Okay, uh, Mr. Hurd? No questions. Okay, and Mr. Diggins. No questions. Okay, and I don't have any questions either. So uh, on a motion by Mr. Helmuth, seconded by Mrs. Mahan, Attorney Hine. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Helmuth. Yes. Mrs. Mahan. Yes. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Thank you, folks. The name is both. Okay, thank you. Before we go to the next, my, would it, did members like a, a five minute break at this point or? Okay, why don't we do that? I think we can. Get on, get back on 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 track when we come back. But why don't we take a five minute break? It's uh, nine thirty eight. We'll be back at nine forty three. Okay, great. Okay, well, welcome back to the second half of the select board meeting this evening. Um, we are now moving on to the consent agenda, and this will be items seven through eleven. I'll ask that item twelve be removed from the consent agenda. Um, item seven, minutes of meeting, June 21, 2021. Item eight, for approval, Boston Women's Market at Uncle Sam Plaza, Saturday, September 11th, 2021, 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. Item nine, reappointments, all terms to expire June 30th, 2024. Council on Aging, Ann Brown, Disability Commission, Michael Rademacher. Item 10, for approval, Annual Walter V. Moynihan Town Day Run, September 18th, 2021. Joseph Connolly, Director of Recreation. Item 11, request for a special one day beer and wine license, September 11th, 2021 at Robbins Memorial Town Hall for a private event, Amy Keating and Brian Silva. Um, on the consent agenda, uh, Mr. Helmuth. Thank you, I move approval. Thank you, Mr. Helmuth. Uh, Mrs. Mahan? Second, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Mr. Hurd. No comments. Great. Mr. Diggins. No comments. Thank you. So a motion by Mr. Helmuth, seconded by Mrs. Mahan. Attorney Heim. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Helmuth? Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Yes. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Unanimous vote. Great, thank you. Um, Appointments, items 13 and 14. Item 13, appointments to the Community Preservation Act Committee. We'll take these one at a time. Uh, Alexander Franzosa, term to expire June 30th, 2023. Susan Doctro and David Swanson for terms to expire on June 30th, 2024. Um, these are first time Appointments. I don't know if any of the uh, individuals are with us tonight. I, I believe Mr. Franzosa is. Yes, I believe all three are, and Mr. Franzosa is joining us right now. Okay, great.
Great. Um, so why don't we start with Mr. Franzosa? And uh, first of all, thank you for your willingness to serve the community. If you could just tell us a little bit about your interest in serving on the, uh, the Community Preservation Act Committee. Sure thing. Thank you all for having me on this forum tonight. My interest in serving on the Community Preservation Act Committee comes from my interest in serving my town. I've been a lifelong resident of Arlington and I love living here. I plan on living here for quite some time. I ran for town meeting this past year and I won and I enjoyed my time uh, serving during town meeting and I've been looking for ways to serve in the meantime. The Community Preservation Act Committee to me would be an excellent way to serve my town. When I ran for town meeting, I promised the constituents that I would support the interests of our town's infrastructure, preservation of historic buildings, and affordable housing. And when I found that this committee would be serving in all those capacities, I was very enthused and uh, submit an application and uh, I'd be honored to serve on this committee. Great, thank you very much. I'll turn it to um, board members. Why don't we go one at a time, Mr. Chapelain, and then if we have uh, for, for questions anyway, I'm Mr. Helma. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Alexander. It was great to meet you uh, at the uh, interview. Thanks for your willingness to serve. And, you know, I was really taken with your, your true passion for service in local government. I think that's, that's wonderful for someone at any age, but particularly uh, someone um, just starting out in the career. It's exemplary. So, uh, so we appreciate that. And, uh, and I'll just say this kind of respect with respect to all, all the applicants. Uh, I think a lot of you know that the CPA committee is near and dear to my heart. It was my previous gig before I got this new one. And it is unique. It is, it's wonderful because there's a, a dedicated funding stream to do things that wouldn't get done because they're never a short-term priority, but they're really long-term long priorities. So uh, I'm thrilled with, with the quality of all the applicants that we received and the appointments that, we're, that we are, I hope, make tonight. And I think that it leaves the committee with fresh ideas, fresh, fresh blood, and um, some good hard workers for, for the task of sorting through all the different possibilities and opportunities that we have. So, um, so thanks to you and, and to the others for, your, uh, for stepping up. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Helmuth. Mrs. Mahan. Thank you, Mr. Francois, and also to uh, Ms. Dr. or Mr. Swanson, um, who um, I have worked on endeavors with in the past, and I look forward to um, working with Ms. Francosa. Um, one thing I will say is I, I'm really excited by your energy and your commitment and, and definitely your follow through, as well as with um, Sue and David. Um, just because I have you here, um, what I would say moving forward to continue on what um, my colleague, Mr. Helmuth and my, our former colleague, Ms. Clarissa Rowe, which is, CPA, as you know, as all of you know, is not a standalone. Um, it's usually in partnership with um, CDBG, with Arlington Housing Authority, with the Historical Society. And one of the things I've um, uh, found on CDBG is um, we have a good framework in there in terms of making sure, you know, if we need to buy four pies, um, not only working together to get the funding, but having that communication back and forth so that um, we don't, I'm not saying this has been done, but there was one particular item, I think it was last year, um, and it had nothing to do with CPA, but the request went into three different ways to be funded and it was funded all three different ways. Um, and it was only about a $51,000 um, request, but my thing is where everything, um, Every uh, project is important, you know, whether it's has two zeros or five zeros, four zeros. Um, I, I, I wanna make sure I do and everybody else does a better job with that, as well as um, I know uh, Mr. Helmuth and Ms. Rowe uh, have a good relationship with the Arlington Housing Authority, but similar to Mr. Franzosa and Ms. Doctor and Mr. Swanson coming, um, there are some new um, people over there Fiorella Badilla, who we appointed tonight. Um, we have an acting executive director. So whatever outreach um, you can do with that, because um, I know during COVID-19, I felt a little frustrated because um, 
I want to spend all the funding that we should, that we raise and can do, um, but we couldn't do that because it's COVID-19. So, but I want to make sure that um, we'll, we'll always be dealing with COVID. So that's not going anywhere. Just hopefully people take care of themselves. Um, but moving forward, uh, you know, the, the monies are there. I'm not saying spend it down every year, but, um, and I know you guys are going to have the energy and commitment and knowledge um, having town meeting and other committees with, with you. So sorry for that lengthy <laughs> pitch and welcome. Thank you. Great, thank you, Mrs. Mahan. Uh, Mr. Hurd. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Franzosa for stepping up to serve. I know I owe you an email back to meet up at some point, hopefully in the early fall. Um, but again, just echoing the comments, you know, this is such an important committee and it, like Mr. Helma said, is I love that CPA can fund projects that otherwise don't get funding, such as the gutters at the Jason Russell House or renovating the town hall gardens and the fountain, which with all our expenses that we have, it's hard to, to fit those into a budget. Um, so you do important work and I appreciate your enthusiasm and look forward to working with you. Great, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hurd, Mr. Diggins. Yes, uh, Ms. Franzosa, really happy to um, have you um, join uh, the, um, the CPAC. It, uh, it, it, I'm partial to people with a science background. It, uh, and also, I, I know I talk about youth engagement and it's not so much that I have an infatuation with youth as much as it is that the, the, the policies that we make we, are policies that young people are gonna have to live with a lot longer than we will. And so it's really important to have you have a voice in that. And so I am thrilled that you are a member of town meeting uh, in addition to wanting to be a part of um, CPAC. So thank you. Great, thank, thank you, Mr. Diggins. And yeah, I also wanna echo the, the, the comments of my colleagues. First of all, congratulations on your election to, to Precinct 12, not an easy precinct to, to an election in. So it's very impressive. And, um, and for your interest in serving on this committee. Um, what I think I will do, we had questions from Mr. Franzosa. His, he's got a term to expire June 30th, 2023. Why don't we bring Ms. Doctorow and Mr. Swanson on together now, and then we'll have one vote for, for um, all three individuals. Mr. DeCourcy, may I? Yes. Uh, as long as no member has an objection to to pooling the votes, if that's okay with me. Yeah, is there any objection to that? If I'm, okay, when we get there, th thank you for that, that Attorney Heim. Uh, we will um, we'll, we'll bear that in mind. Um, good evening, Ms. Doctorow. Hi. Hi, um, thank you for um, for your interest in serving on the Community, Pre Community Preservation Act Committee. And, I uh, want you to tell us a little bit about your interest and uh, see if there's any questions from the board. Sure, and you're most welcome. Um, happy to be here. Yeah, I became interested in this opportunity, not because of any specific expertise that I have in the three areas of interest, because I'm really not an expert in these areas, but I greatly value all of them. I became interested more because of my enthusiasm for the CPA projects that have already been funded and how they touch our lives in town, because they really do. Um, and I had a lot more specific details in my letter, so I won't repeat those here um, in the interest of brevity. But um, I've lived here almost 18 years and I've been involved in several town and community volunteer activities, including as a town meeting member. And I think that gives me a good feel for the, what the work on the com committee would be like. Um, and also who to approach for advice and feedback in these areas of expertise that I'm supposed to be learning about. Um, and actually, I think this speaks to the outreach and cooperation that Ms. Mahan alluded to earlier. Um, so really, I'd be very honored to be part of the CPAC and I, I'm grateful for your appreciation. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Doctor. And uh, good evening, Mr. Swanson. Um, Thank you for your interest, and, and if you could just let the board know um, 
your specific interest in the uh, Community Preservation Act Committee. Sure. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you uh, to the board. My name is Dave Swanson. Uh, very excited um, uh, at the opportunity to join CPAC. I guess I would highlight um, uh, maybe three three things either about me and, and about my interest in CPAC. I, I think first and foremost, and you heard it from Sue and, and from Alex, it's just um, passion for public service and, and an interest in in um, preserving, I, I think, uh, the character of Arlington, right? I've had the opportunity to serve on town meeting for uh, the past four years to uh, see uh, Eric Helmuth and the team give wonderful presentations about um, uh, the activities of CPAC, about the projects uh, that they're engaged in locally. And, and frankly, many of those projects, my family and I enjoy um, on a monthly, uh, monthly, weekly basis. And so, um, the mission of CPAC is something I'm uh, absolutely behind and very enthusiastic about and is what um, I think first drew me uh, to this particular opportunity. I'd say secondly, I perhaps bring a, a, a unique um, a professional background to the role. I, uh, I'm a lawyer by uh, education and training. I serve um, as uh, chief of staff and general counsel to our state senators, so I have uh, a level of familiarity with um, the, the state's um, authorizing act, the, the Community Preservation Act, um, uh, the, the debate that takes place around, um, you know, the continual funding need uh, or increase in funding around the Community Preservation Act Trust Fund um, and, uh, and, you know, hopefully can bring that, that body of knowledge um, to CPAC. And I guess the third thing I would highlight is um, that it, it'd be my hope to sort of uh, hit the ground running. This wouldn't be my first um, local volunteerism uh, um, uh, endeavor. I, I served on the Arlington Human Rights Commission before. Um, when I lived in Newton, I served on the Newton Economic uh, Development Commission. And so uh, I do have a level of familiarity with how commissions and town committees fit within the larger town governance, how they fit within the interaction between town and, and state governance, um, and look forward to, 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 to volunteering and, and working within that, that structure. And, and like Sue mentioned, and I think to, to Ms. Mahone's point, um, look forward to collaborating with, um, with the, the, the very clear um, uh, intersections that the CPAC has with other, with other town bodies. So I'm very excited for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Swanson. And I will go in the same order with the board, starting with our former CPAC member, Mr. Helmut. Thank you. So, so, so as to Ms. Doctorow's comments about not having a particular expertise in the CPA areas, <laughs> neither did I, and they ended up making right. it here. So watch out. <laughs> That's and, the only reason uh, I was brave enough to say that. <laughs> but, ser but seriously, though, I, I think Ms. Mahan really hit on it, that the, the, the key of being effective in this, in this committee is the collaboration, the understanding how things get done, collaborative work within the committee with other uh, elements of town, uh, because CPA doesn't have that much money any one given year, but it's really powerful as, as leverage funds and in partnership with other with other entities. So I think you know that the you you and Dave both have have that depth of experience and understanding um, how it works in town meeting. I think that you'll you'll bring both of that will bring that and and Dave, yes, we we did we did think about your day job. And, uh, and with gratitude, uh, because the state legislative leadership does have a lot to do with the success of the program. So, uh, so thank you both for, for stepping up. Great. Thank you, Mr. Helm. With Mrs. Mahan. I will gladly second uh, Mr. Helmut's motion. And I did all my speak at the beginning because it was basically uh, to all three. Um, but I definitely uh, appreciate both Sue and Dave, along with Alex, um, taking this on and uh, agree with my colleague, Mr. Helmuth, Eric, all of you are uh, definitely qualified um, and, and will, the town will benefit from your service again. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Mrs. Mahan. Mr. Hurd. Again, just thank you both for your willingness to serve. You're all familiar faces. And so we have the full faith that you'll be able to step right into this role and be effective members from the first day. So thank you for your willingness to continue to serve the town of Arlington. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Mr. Diggins. And um, 
Ms. Doctro, being I'm partial to you because you used to be on TAC, and we all know how important <laughs> TAC is. You know, and, and and but more so, I mean, you know, uh, when I first became a town meeting member and, and came to the Envision Arlington Standing Committee uh, to start working on the precinct meetings, you and Elizabeth Carr Jones, along with Julie Brazil, were very supportive and encouraging, and and and. Uh, um, and, and very warm and welcoming. And I always tell people, well, you've heard me say repeatedly how warm and welcoming Arlington has been, I mean, and supportive. Uh, and you are one of the one of those one of those people. I mean, and then to look at your resume, I mean, I mean, I knew some of it, but I didn't know as much of it as there. I mean, you're you're truly impressive, you know, uh, uh, and, and so so gentle on top of that, you know. So so uh, so thanks for your willingness to do this. And um, Mr. Swanson, I mean, as I said, potentially a governor, I mean, uh, I mean uh, but, uh, but, but, uh, but, uh, but also, I mean, I mean, uh, I mean, one thing that you learn in politics, I mean, is that you never know when you're going to be on the other side of the table, I mean, and so, so Mr. Swanson is here, you know, before us, I mean, to uh, be approved to be on the, uh, on CPAC, but I've been in communication with him, trying to arrange a meeting with um, him uh, and or um, Senator Friedman uh, uh, to work with the group that is trying to get a regional, um, uh, uh, I'm sorry, a real estate transfer fee. Feed. And that's happened uh, with the Boston MPO and members of the Senate. So, so uh, you know, we're all just one I mean, group of people who have various roles at various times just working together to try to make this place better and, and you three uh, will be a part of that in our community so thank you great thank, th thank you mr diggins and I, I also want to thank you both in addition to mr francesa for your willingness to serve and, and for your service to the town as town meeting members we have three town meeting members here who have stepped up and, and are willing to serve in the cpac committee and and uh, that's really impressive so thank you so much for that so just to clarify mr helmuth your motion is for all three of the um, candidates here for, for appointment. Yes. Okay, and that has yes. been second. And, and, th and thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm not sure that I actually said the magic words. Uh, so I, I do move uh, a confirmation approval appoint appointment. That's it. Uh, one okay. of those, we get it right, of the three candidates. Okay, great. And, and that has been seconded by Mrs. Mahan. Attorney Heim. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I just want to remind folks that the town manager, Adam Chapdelaine, has a vote. Uh, as per the Community Preservation Act's uh, committee's bylaw. So with that, um, Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes, sorry about Mr. the video. Mr. Helmuth. Yes. Mrs. Mahan. Yes. Mr. DeCorsi. Yes. Mr. Chapdelaine. Yes. It's unanimous 6-0 vote. Thank you. Right. Thank you all very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, item 14, Sims Memorial Fund Board of Directors, update from the Board of Directors. And we also have an appointment before us for uh, Alan Reedy for a term to expire June 30th, 2024. Um, I don't know, do we have Mr. Marr with us tonight, Mr. Chapdelaine? I believe we have both. So I, I'm going to bring Alan and John forward. Sure. Okay. They should be joining the meeting shortly. Yeah. And I, I believe we're going to have the update first, and then we'll have the proposed appointment of um, Mr. Reedy second. Um, good evening, Mr. Marr. Mr. Reedy, good evening, Mr. Reedy. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Okay, and it's Mr. Marmy, I, I believe he's about to, to join us. Hello. Good evening, Mr. Marr. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, it's a uh, it's, uh, delight for me to be uh, before the board again. It's been several years since my retirement. Uh, uh, just on a personal note, I probably had attended somewhere. The board used to meet every week, uh, starting in, when I was 1973 when I came on. And if you do the math, it's probably around 900 board meetings. 
And it was frankly the highlight of my life. I mean, people would look forward to the weekend. It, the weekend was something for me to just get through in order to get to the Monday meeting. Uh, and uh, it's, it's just delightful to, to be before you again. And uh, it, it think, just when I thought things couldn't get any better, I'm at the end of the agenda. But be that as it may, I'm here as the chairman of the Sims uh, Memorial Fund, and I just want to give you briefly a little bit of background as to why I'm here, other than to hopefully welcome Alan, my colleague, uh, top meeting member, and member of the Permanent Building Committee. Until 1994, uh, as you know, Arlington had a community hospital, Sims, uh, Sims Hospital, for a variety of reasons. Community hospitals fell by the wayside due to med low Medicare reimbursements and the proximity of Boston's highly regarded teaching hospitals. Leahy Clinic, which is now part of the Death Beth Israel system, being Beth Israel Leahy Health now, took over operation of Sims mainly as a feeder to its Burlington campus. In 2001, Leahy filed for voluntary dissolution of Sims uh, with the Supreme Judicial Court since it was frankly was losing money uh, and attempted uh, in the process to assume control of all of its endowments and accumulated funds in the approximate amount of $3 million, mostly made up of excess Medicare reimbursements. This select board at that time, uh, principally led by Charlie Lyons and acting on the advice of the town's crack legal department said not so fast. That money belongs to Arlington at its prior patients and citizens. After much negotiations, we reached agreement with Leahy and asked the Supreme Judicial Court to order the establishment of the SIMS Nonprofit Medical Youth Program Committee, made up of three members appointed by Arlington and three by Leahy. And grants were made by this committee to Arlington nonprofits, generally for medical related uses. In 2008, Leahy and the town decided that it was better that we split the blanket and with, that, and with about $1 million to be under control of the town and $1 million to be under control of Leahy, again, to be spent respectively for medical projects in town. The other $1 million was to be held by Leahy to defray the cost of Sims pensions and for um, uh, the retention of medical records. In the meantime, uh, since that date, uh, the town end of the committee incorporated as a 501c3. And up and a couple years ago, we changed with the Secretary of State's office to shorten the mouthful name, uh, which I previously indicated, the SIMS Nonprofit and Medical Use Program Committee, to simply the SIMS. Uh, memorial Front. Charlie Lyons, our longtime chair, has retired from the board, and thus the vacancy before you this evening. And I'm uh, very glad to see that the manager has proposed Alan Reedy to succeed Charlie in, uh, in that vacancy. Alan serves as my chair on the permanent billing committee. He would make an excellent addition with his medical administration background. He will join uh, Jackie Keshin, who is the other member along with myself. I currently serve as chair. Our longtime excellent outside counsel, Dick Keshin, has also retired from, that, from his practice. And I will assume those uh, counsel duties, of course, on a pro bono basis. Over the years, we have contributed nearly $750,000 to such organizations as the School Department for Special Programs, Council on Aging for Medical Rides, Boys and Girls, the Boys of Arlington Boys and Girls Club, Arlington Eats, uh, Food Link, the Youth Consultation Center, and other Arlington nonprofits. We generally designate only up to 5% of our principal each year for our grants, which we go out for grants in the spring. And we just, for this year, we just made our grants uh, a week and a half ago. We uh, invest uh, through Rockland Trust, our principal in conservative investments. 
I'm here tonight to advise you that Leahy has come to the, now um, Beth Israel Leahy has come to the conclusion that the original purpose of the separate $1 million, which was for medical record retention pension benefits, the, better, the, uh, the purpose of that has been fulfilled. And they seek to distribute these funds. Uh, and they're proposing that one half of the million dollars goes to the Sims Memorial Fund and Leahy, uh, Beth Israel Leahy will take control of the other uh, $500,000. Leahy, uh, Beth Israel Leahy has indicated, in my mind, has clearly shown themselves to be extremely good corporate citizens to the benefit of the town and its um, citizens over the years. And we, uh, I think we ought to join them at the Supreme Judicial Court and ask for a modification of the original dissolution order to permit the, the uh, distribution of these funds. The additional $500,000 will be added to our current principal, which will substantially increase the borrow fund's ability to make grants. We generally spend about, as I say, 5%, which is about $45,000 or $50,000 each year. It could raise it up to about 70 or 75,000, which would greatly enhance our ability to meet medical use, nonprofit needs in the community. Uh, I therefore respectfully request that the board take the following vote, which I will propose to you after I field any questions you, that you might have. And this uh, vote has been previously submitted to the town manager and town council. And I think it was distributed in your packets in the circulating file over the weekend. So with that, I'm glad to entertain any questions. And once we have done, I feel that any questions, hopefully satisfactorily, I'll propose the vote. Great. Uh, well, thank, thank you, Mr. Maher. I, I, I knew you would enjoy the meeting tonight. So we, we pushed you a little bit further back at, into into the agenda, so yes. it's good to yes. it's so good much. to see you. Yes. So, <laughs> um, so I I will um, turn it to the board for questions or comments, and I will start with Mrs. Mahan. Um, uh, no, thank you, Mr. DeCourcy. I, I well, I do have one question before the motion. Um, I think I heard um, about the initial uh, negotiations, and now a second negotiations, and after this. Um, that funding source uh, will no longer exist. So this is the last time we'll go through this process. Am I correct? I'm sorry, Diane, I didn't get that. Um, the, we did the, this the once many... We've already, I'm sorry, maybe I understand it. We have okay. undertaken the negotiation and they have agreed to essentially split the billion dollars. We only need now to go to the Supreme Judicial Court to amend the original dissolution order, which, which the SJC had set aside that $1 million, gave it over to Leahy for pension benefits and medical use retention. Now, they no longer need it for that, and they're willing to split that $1 million dollars. Okay, thank you. That clears it up for me. And uh, if I could, Mr. Chair, um, if we could take these separate, just because, um, One's an appointment and one's a one-time action for the rest of this. I'd like to move that the town of Arlington acting by and through its select board and town manager authorizes and encourages the Sims Memorial Fund Board of Directors to do all things necessary and appropriate, including without limitation, filing all necessary motions with the Supreme Judicial Court or other court of competent jurisdiction in conjunction with the office of the Attorney General to effect a distribution of funds remaining from the dissolution of Sims Hospital, Inc., or any of its related entities to the Sims Memorial Fund to further its corporate purpose of aiding medical use or related organizations, be they public or private in the town of Arlington. Great, thank, thank you, Mrs. Mahan. Um, Mr. Hurd. Thank you, I will second that motion and thank you, Mr. Mahan for the presentation. Uh, I hope Mr. Reedy, shares your affinity for watching select board meetings since we he got pushed <laughs> into the meeting as well but um but i do want to thank you and your many many years of service and i can only hope that we have attorney heim in our services for as long as we, as the town enjoyed your services as town council thank you mr hurd thank you mr hurd mr diggins 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. And through you, a question to Mr. Maher. And so when the meetings were once a week, um, or every week, were they shorter? No, no. Uh, <laughs> it, it depends on who the chair was. When Harry McCabe was the chair, uh, we were there. Uh, was it unusual for us to be there to a quarter of one, one o'clock? Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. They were made of hardiest stuff back then. Oh, my goodness. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Well, well, that's it. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. Um, Mr. Hellman. Thank you. Uh, do we need a motion for Mr. Reedy's appointment? We're, we're going to go to Mr. Reedy afterwards. I okay. thank him for his patience because right. it's two separate motions. We're going to deal with this first. Okay, great. Yeah, no, happy to support this. Thank you, Mr. Mar. It's great to great to see you in fine form yet again. <laughs> great. Thank you, Mr. Helmuth. And um, with Mrs. Mahan's motion, I, I believe that's consistent with what you were going to propose, Mr. Mar. So I. I Thank you for all your years of service, um, both in the employment of the town and since then on, on the Sims Memorial Fund and for all your work and, uh, and your work at town meeting as well. Don't forget that I'm chairman of your uh, uh, cable advisory committee. All right, well, we forgot that one. And thank you for that as well. Um, I, well, you didn't forget it because I just told you, just reminded you. That's right, you just, you refreshed my recollection. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much. So on a, a motion by Mrs. Mahan, seconded by Mr. Hurd, Attorney Hahn. And Mr. Chair, if I may also share my sense that uh, Mr. Marr did an excellent job and along with the rest of the uh, committee in drawing up this or negotiating this dissolution. With that, uh, Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Helmet. Yes. Mrs. Mahan. Yes. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. It's an unanimous vote. Great. Thank you very much, Mr. Mar. Thank you. Um, and good evening, Mr. Reedy. Thank you for, for waiting a, a few additional minutes and, and for your interest in serving on the um, Sims Memorial Fund Board of Directors. And if you'd like to say a few words to the board before we go to questions in a, in a vote. Um, and well, by way, uh, good evening, members of the board. It's, uh, it's been a thrilling evening. Yeah. Um, uh, by way of full disclosure, I, I do need to uh, tell you that I just recently concluded a fairly long career with Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, a founding uh, member of the Beth Israel Leahy Health Network. Uh, but now having retired and uh, seeking to promote uh, domestic bliss, um, I, uh, I was responding positively to Mr. Mars. Um, opportunity that he presented to um, provide my, my long suffering wife with uh, relief at least a couple of times a year. And so I uh, look forward to, um, uh, to, to actually joining this, this, this very, uh, you know, certainly well-intentioned and, and uh, you know, proven uh, source of support for uh, the healthcare needs of the Arlington community. Um, uh, I had a similar experience a number of years ago um, uh, with respect to the, uh, the Sims Advisory Committee where I was fortunate to serve alongside your, uh, your current select board chair on that committee. And, and unfortunately, we were not able to uh, generate enough interest at that time to, to uh, preserve healthcare services at that particular site. Um, but uh, you know, with the very, very quickly evolving uh, landscape of, of, of healthcare services in the greater Boston area, I mean, I, I, I do think that this uh, memorial committee, you know, serves a great purpose in the town, and I would uh, certainly look forward to um, helping, as I have done throughout my career at Beth Israel Deaconess, um, you know, assessing and and distributing scarce healthcare dollars to worthy causes. So um, I guess with that, I'll just um, uh, open it up for any questions anybody might have. But uh, again, thank you for your consideration. Thank you very much, Mr. Reedy. Uh, I will start with Mr. Hurd. Sorry about that, clicked off. Um, again, thank you for sticking with us and your willingness to serve in this committee. And we look forward to working with you. Great. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Mr. Diggins. Well, I think I'll second that motion that Mr. Hurd meant to make. Sorry. 
I move approval of the appointment. It is Thank getting Mr. No problem, and I and and, and I, I second it. And clearly, Mr. Reedy, you're 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 qualified. I mean, both with respect to you know your your work history, but also with your ability to speak so eloquently eloquently with your tongue in your cheek. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Diggins. Uh, Mr. Helmuth. Thank you, Mr. Reedy, for being willing to serve. The advisory committee is very fortunate to have you. Um, Great. Thank you, Mr. Helmuth. Mrs. Mahan. Thank you, Mr. Reedy, uh, my uh, AHS touring buddy <laughs> from the other day. And I know when I first came on, onto the scene in politics, which was just town meeting, which I never even envisioned I would do that. I always tried to steer clear of all things um, political. Um, but as a PTO president up at Brackett School, when I first came on the scene, it seemed like everywhere I turned around, there's Alan Reedy, there's Alan Reedy. Um, and I've always been impressed by um, when you do get up to speak, you're, you're succinct, you uh, encapsulate everything that needs to be given forth. Um, and your words, starting from back then and honestly, um, continue until today, are very well respected and well heard. So. I'm glad we found another place that you're uh, allowing us to plug you into. Um, um, I know with uh, uh, John Marin, the third member, um, you guys will make sure we get the most bang for our buck. And um, I'm always impressed that, you know, we'll, we're lucky enough to get someone of your expertise that we could never afford to pay you, <laughs> but you're doing it for us sort of pro bono on this and other um, activities and committees in, in Arlington. So again, my thanks to you. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Mahan. Yeah, and I also want to echo the, the, the comments of my colleagues, Mr. Reedy, it, it, and you mentioned the SIMS Advisory Committee. We worked together years ago on committees, and um, I've seen the work that you've done at town meeting, and, and you're an individual. When you get up to speak at town meeting, people listen and, uh, and, and respect what you have to say. So we're really pleased that, that you're, you're willing to take on this appointment. Um, so with a motion by Mr. Hurd, seconded by Mr. Diggins, Attorney Heim. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Helmuth. Yes. Mrs. Mahan. Yes. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. It's unanimous Great. vote. Great. Thank you, Mr. Reedy, and good luck. And thank you, Mr. Marr. Thank you very much, folks. Thank you. Okay. Um, 1023, we're moving on to open forum. Uh, except in unusual circumstances, any matter presented for consideration of the board shall neither be acted upon nor a decision made the night of the presentation in accordance with the policy under which the open forum was established. It should be noted that there is a three minute time limit to present a concern or request. Oh, uh, you're on mute, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, is there anybody who wishes to be heard during open forum? Uh, there is a series of hands. Would you like me to just uh, take, take them in order? Sure. So the first hand raised is John Ward. Okay. Good evening, Mr. Ward. Mr. Ward? Okay. Doesn't it appear as though he has a speaker connecting. Okay, um, what, what? Let me, uh, he, he has two, his name comes up twice. Let me try his other name. That may work. Good evening, Mr. Ward. Okay. All right, why, why don't we do this? And don't, let's see, we hear from him. Why don't, why don't we go to the next name on the list and we'll see if we can 
address that issue. Okay, the next speaker is Rebecca Gruber. Okay. Good evening, Ms. Gruber. Thank you, Rebecca Gruber, Pleasant Street. Um, I'd like to express my concerns regarding the proposed re precincting. Firstly, I'm wary of the supposition that the new census numbers will require all 21 of our precincts to be redrawn to ensure that every precinct has the population of plus or minus 5% of each other. Um, please be skeptical of that argument being the catalyst for reducing the number of precincts. I suggest that redrawing the precincts either at the current number of 21 or at a reduction to 16 would have a dramatic effect on voter engagement in this town. Here are three possible impacts. Every precinct would have to elect all of its town meeting members. I'm very fearful that requiring our electorate to be engaged enough to educate themselves to make that number of decisions is likely unreasonable and will result in even less engagement in our local town elections, both now and in the future. The requirement that the highest four vote getters fill three-year terms, the second highest two-year terms and so on, may affect future elections as the popularity of incumbents running in any particular year may be inordinately skewed, limiting the possibility of non-incumbent candidates being elected in that year. And finally, specific precincts participation in town governance and in voting very significantly. As we merge residents of different precincts together, to what extent will the loudest voices be those who already have a voice, drowning out the voices of our less vocal or more marginalized town residents? And this is particularly concerning if we reduce the number of precincts from 21 to 16. And while I recognize that Arlington must redraw its precinct boundaries if legally required to do so, we do not have to also reduce our number of precincts. There has been recognition by many in town governance, including some of you, of the value of town meeting members reaching out and developing relationships with their precinct neighbors. As a new town meeting member myself, and thus a candidate who recently campaigned and had the honor of being elected by my precinct eight neighbors, I would like to share with you the joy and the responsibility I feel as a representative working on behalf of my fellow precinct residents. While campaigning and now as an elected official, I walk in the streets of my precinct, every block. This is a special opportunity due to the very walkable size of our precincts for a member of town governance like myself to engage in outreach with the folks we are elected to represent. Looking at the proposed re-precincting map, I fear that this sort of neighborly connection will be almost impossible. Not only will each town meeting member have to represent more residents, but for example, precinct eight will significantly increase geographically as well. In the initial proposal I saw, precinct eight stretch from below Pleasant Street almost up to the water tower, a geographic distance that is not very walk walkable. My fear is that this re-precincting will negatively impact some of the very positive attributes of precinct eight, such as established Excuse communication me, systems. Yeah, if you could just wrap up. Yep, informal mutual aid networks and the other ad hoc mechanisms that develop in caring vibrant neighborhoods because what we all refer to as precincts are in fact in Arlington neighborhoods, not just political boundaries, but communities of residents who have over time come to know one another as neighbors. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gruber. Okay. All right. Can anybody hear me? Is this, is this Mr. Ward? Yes. Okay, go ahead. Thank you for, for listening. Last week, I del had delivered a two-page narrative that laid out the uh, uh, serious problems surrounding the uh, candidate selection process for a tenant member of the board. There are 240 different housing authorities in this state with an undetermined number of tenant organizations. And the real problem in the law is that the tenant organizations were given the authority to make a selection of two to five candidates. Well, they didn't spell out how those tenant organizations are supposed to go about that. So we have 
a myriad of, of uh, processes for coming together with uh, submitting these candidates. This has nothing to do necessarily with the town, but the town puts their stamp of authority by uh, electing, by appointing the, the uh, member. And you want that to be uh, uh, as democratic a process as possible. Now the Arlington Housing Authority has two, a little over 700 residences and less than 30% of those were properly notified of the opportunity. Um, I want to uh, commend you that you selected the best person out of the list that was given to you tonight. And I'm grateful for that. But I'm, sh I'm hoping that in some way that uh, we've got, now we have two years to get the legislature to correct these shortcomings in the law that allows the tenant organizations to willy nilly come up and do whatever they want with uh, uh, submitting names to the, the towns for their um, review. And I'm hoping that somebody in, in, your, in and amongst of you that are listening will uh, enjoin me, uh, or will join me in uh, um, lobbying Mr. Sean Garbali that, to see that this kind of uh, uh, correction is made to a uh, public housing notice 2021-1 that clears up this process so that uh, in two years from now, uh, the candidates that you, you receive uh, uh, represent are a true representation of what the spirit of the law says, because the spirit of the law says clearly that all residents should be notified of the opportunity. And that simply did not happen here. Um, I don't know if any of you people actually took an opportunity to read that narrative, but for what it's worth, it's still, it appears in the agenda tonight if somebody wants to take a look. And I thank you for your taking your time to listen to me. Thank you, Mr. Ward, and I, and I will point out that letter is in correspondence received. We will be addressing that later, and board members did receive it. Um, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chapdelling, next name on the list? Petru Sofio. Good evening. Hi. Good evening. Hi. Um, thank you for your time. I'm here at the meeting to let the select board know about an issue with the new signal at Bleak Street in the Miniman. Recently, cars have been driving onto the path at an alarming rate. Some even going down towards AOA or to Lindenwood Street. This is very dangerous, especially when it happens on weekends, when small families are often riding on this trail. I'd like to see the board make it a priority for DPW to make swift and dedicated to be swift and dedicated in making changes so it's not possible to drive on the Minuteman. I also wanted to comment on the select board's upcoming Mass and Appleton short-term plan discussion. I would like to encourage the board to get this item looked at and voted on as soon as possible. It has been over a year since Charlie Proctor was killed at this intersection, and there have been multiple injuries since one even in this past July. Please consider bringing this item to the board very soon so we can hopefully make some changes to save some lives. Thank you so much for your time. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Sofio. Um, next, I think, I believe we have two more hands raised. Okay. Next is Lynette Culverhouse. Good evening, Ms. Cal Culverhouse. Hi. Um, yeah, I, I wanted to um, say that I am really impressed with the net zero plan um, and um, recognize that a lot of work has gone into coming up with a really good document. What concerns me, though, is that while it is a great document, that it's very easy to congratulate ourselves for a great document. But I'm still seeing residents um, pulling down houses, tearing down trees, driving gas consuming cars. And I really want to see us and urge you to please have a publicity campaign to residents um, to impose on them the urgency of um, the, the environmental crisis we're in. Every mature tree that gets chopped down 
is a carbon consuming vehicle that we're removing and therefore threatening our environment even, even more. Every house that we pull down is um, an environmental, has a negative environmental impact. And um, I, I can't tell you how many SUVs and gas consuming cars I see driving around town. Um, and, and I think that um, what needs to happen is um, the town leadership needs to put out some kind of publicity campaign saying the town, the town is urging residents to recognize the urgency of our environmental crisis and to take individual responsibility for um, improving it. And, and you know, while I recognize this country values individual rights over the rights of um, the whole community or the earth. Um, I think that we can, as a community, take that kind of leadership and, and model um, for our residents how we would like, how we like, would like each person to take responsibility for the crisis. So thank you for your time. Thank, thank you very much. Um, and I believe there's one more person for open forum. Beth Olofchik. Okay. Good evening, Ms. Olofchik. Yep, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll set the floor, Joyce. Hi, thank you. Um, Beth Malofchek, Russell Street. Um, sorry, I'm really, really tired. Um, the net zero plan, a lot of effort has gone into it. I recognize that. And I'm frankly terrified, as I think many of my fellow community members are, um, with the new uh, UN report that's been released on Code Red for Humanity. So I um, recognize, as we all do, uh, that the earth is warming faster than anticipated and that we need to lower greenhouse gases, as Lynette just pointed out, and we need some town leadership on that. And I, I thank her for, for raising those points. I hope you'll all embrace them. Um, and in removing carbon, we have that excellent um, uh, God-given um, device of the tree. So I speak to ask all of you to um, embrace the notion that we need a tree canopy plan as extensive and well thought out um, and with as much effort as the net zero plan. I think trees are mentioned in one tiny spot in the net zero plan. I forget what page, I know Ken sent it to me many months back, but I think we need a comprehensive tree canopy plan we need to be planting many more trees than we plant now. I hope there'll be some funding for that, perhaps part of the 34 million. I think we need to inventory all of our forested areas, our public forested areas that we have right now to see how, can, how they can be maintained and made even more efficient for the health and well being of the community and to lower and reduce the warming. Right now, we're all told, if you read uh, the Atlantic piece on the UN report, um, we need to reduce the warming, slow the warming to any extent possible. That means preserving our trees, planting many, many more than we're doing now. And um, uh, as Lynette said, let's stop cutting them down. So maybe we can plug the hole, perhaps the board could direct the tree canopy to look at the holes in the current uh, tree bylaw, who, who is required to file a tree plan. I believe Article 38, Posse Miettinen's uh, cement article for foundations has a big loophole in it. Uh, if the footprint is not changed, they're not required to file a tree plan. So we don't wanna lose those um, mature trees on those pieces of property because we all know 
how important the work that the trees do to reduce the warming and remove uh, particulate matter, the pollution. Um, the other thing is, I'd like to remind everybody about the forty million dollar override. Think, excuse me, Miss Malovchuk, you're, you're over three minutes. So if if so, let you me complete that first point. Let me yeah, close with the seconds. forty million dollar override. Thank you very much. So can we stop spending and perhaps use some of that thirty four million dollars to pay down the debt? Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, that completes open forum for this evening. Um, the next item, we're going to take two items together. Item 12 is a request for a special one day beer and wine license, September 18th, 2021, at the Ed Burns Arena for Tande Run. Item 15 for approval is a beer garden at the Jason Russell House, Saturdays during September 2021. Uh, Brian Burke, the president of Burke's Brewing Company, which I believe is in Hanover, Mass is with us this evening. Um, Mr. Burke. And, and Patsy Kramer, I believe, is with us as well. Good evening, Mr. Burke. Good evening. How are you this evening? Good, thanks. Thank you for uh, staying up with us. <laughs> I know it's sure. been late and it's been a long meeting and uh, it, I believe Patsy is going to be joining us as well. So we decide to combine both of the items. If you want to just talk to us briefly about each one, and then we'll open it up to questions from the board. Yeah, certainly. Uh, my name is Brian Burke. Um, I own a small little brewery down in Hanover, Massachusetts on the South Shore. Um, I, until recently, was a resident of Watertown, so I'm very familiar with the area. Spent a lot of time biking through Watertown, through the Minuteman Trail, and um, I read with some interest a few weeks back about the uh, former beer garden that was in town um, conducted by my former employer, Aeronaut. And, um, you know, when, when they were unable to do it this year, you know, with the restrictions uh, slow to re, be sort of dropped and an easing of the COVID restrictions, um, but there was still a, it seemed to be a good amount of desire to have a beer garden in town that people found it to be a positive um, social activity. So uh, I approached a couple members of the town to see if there'd be much interest. And uh, I was introduced to Patsy and, and we met and we talked a little bit about the uh, Jason Russell house and she showed me around the, gra the grounds here. And we thought it might be a great place for people to spend some time outside, listen to some music. Um, I think in light of the last year and a half um, and perhaps with what's starting to go on now with COVID that uh, just a place to go outdoors, family communi community sort of focused event would be something that would be nice. Um, and as a quick aside to that, as I was having those discussions, I was approached by uh, Joe Connolly of the um, Recreation Department about the road race. And he asked if I would also participate in uh, having a beer tent. Great. Thank, thank, thank you, Mr. Burke. Uh, good evening, Patsy. Th thank you for uh, uh, staying along here with us tonight. Did you want to add anything to? I'm just, I'm just in representing the Arlington Historical Society that we're very pleased at the possibility of hosting uh, a beer garden uh, on our lawn. Uh, and we know that the original one was, was very, very popular and draws a lot of, of family people. And we think for, uh, for us, it's just great visibility to have people share our lawn and, and be aware of the Jason Russell House. So we're, we're thrilled at the opportunity. Great, I, 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 thank you very much. I'll turn it to the board for questions or comments. Uh, Mr. Hurd. Thank you. I will move approval on both requests and thank Mr. Burke for choosing Arlington. We had a really good experience with the beer garden when we had it in the center. Um, I've had a lot of constituents who have reached out asking when we're going to have another beer garden. We weren't able to do it this summer, but there's definitely a lot of interest and I think it'd be very well received. I want to thank the Arlington Historical Society for stepping up and giving us a location, given that our lost location is under construction. So I do look forward to this. I think it's good for the town and I think it's good for the residents and I will be there. Great day. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Uh, Mr. Diggins. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm, gonna I'm gonna hold off on seconding for a little bit because I need to ask a couple of questions um, regarding uh, COVID and how you're going to 
approached that. The, I asked because the the um, the Sand Sculpture Festival in Revere Beach, pretty open. Me, they were recommending that people still mask. And, uh, uh, and so I'm just wondering what kind of advice are you going to give to the people um, for um, the September, which is pretty close by. And even though, I mean, I'm hoping things don't get worse, you know, I don't know how much better it's going to be than they are now. Thanks. I think what we would do is follow the advice of the Board of Health in terms of uh, at that point in time, how things look and whatever they suggest, we'll be, we'll be sure to follow. Yeah, and, and to second what Patsy said, I, I agree with you there. Um, unfortunately, we have a lot of experience in the last year and a half um, operating in this kind of environment. So, you know, my staff is pretty well versed. We will take advice and guidance of local authorities with regards to that. If masking is what's required, um, you know, we'll do so. We've done that for a year and a half. We'll have the usual, you know, um, hand sanitizers available. We can clean common surfaces, you know, going into the bathrooms. Um, I think it really depends. We'll have to monitor because, you know, we are seeing a little bit of a spike right now. I'm hearing some words that it may be plateauing, but, you know, I'll believe it when I see it. I think um, we'll monitor. It's still about four weeks away. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll monitor it. We'll do what, what guidance that we're given to manage it. Yeah, and I'll just say that I mean, I, I, um, I, I mean, I'm a little concerned I mean, about the potential of, of sending mixed messages to the um, the residents I mean, where we're telling people you know, to mask indoors. I mean, um, uh, and and we're, we're giving guidance I means if you're if you're vaccinated I mean, and and you're okay because you don't have people who are you know sick in your household or whatever then then you can you know, feel somewhat more comfortable doing it. I just still feel that we need to be more consistent rather than less. I mean, um, no one's gonna probably be 100% consistent in this. I'm certainly not. You know, I mean, I kind of calibrate the risks that I take. I mean, uh, 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 and so I, I don't want us to be um, too aggressive in things. And I certainly understand the desire of people to socialize and so I, I guess I just want to make sure that the town manager and our department of health feel comfortable um, saying, even though the board has signed off on this, meaning that we are going to advise against it. And I'd hope that we would support them in that. So, uh, so with that, I, mean, I will second. Uh, thank you for listening. Uh, Thank, thank, thank you, Mr. Diggins. Uh, Mr. Helmuth. Thank you. Um, and, and I appreciate very much the, the, the detail and the care that was in your applications, particularly for the, for the beer garden event. Um, the attention, I appreciate particularly the attention given to the safe, the safe service plan um, and the emphasis on the TIP certification. That's really important. And it gives me a high level of confidence that you'll not only pay attention to that, but also to some of the health um, concerns that my colleague just just mentioned as well. So so that's great. And, and I think speaking for myself, uh, I'm happy to support both of these. I, I have confidence in our vigilant um, health department, board of health and, and town manager to really provide good guidance. And, you know, I think if they feel like it's not safe to go forward. I, I know that they'll they'll say so and that you understand. Mm -hmm. um, I think so. So I, I'm fine with it. And uh, I think there'll be a lot of people that provided that we're allowed to have, able to have the, have, able to have the event will be, uh, will be very happy to see a return of the beer garden near Arlington Center. My, my only question is uh, if we know that if Jason Russell drank beer, uh, will there be <laughs> one, one named after him? Because there's an obvious marketing tie in here with some history. I think we could have some fun with that for sure. I bet we could. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Helmuth. Mrs. Mahan. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just something to put out there and, and you all can sort of ponder on it or not. I know when the beer garden first started Saturdays um, in the summer at its previous site, uh, similar to last month, uh, that first month, it seemed to like rain just about every Saturday, you know, pretty decent rain, not heavy, heavy. And uh, everyone was looking for information. Is there a rain date? Is there not a rain date? So my thing, my question to you would be if circumstances dictate that, that we can do this event, um, if it's, um, how are you gonna get the word out if 
Saturdays of rain out. Um, and you don't have to. It's just that I know, you know, the first year I was sort of like going back and forth. Um, and I'm not saying right now we're not approving that you can do Sundays also, but uh, if you kind of look at the weather map out um, and that's something you need to revisit, uh, I'd certainly be open to that. But, and it's not, I'm not saying it's a requirement. You have to tell me tonight or tell anybody ever what you're going to do um, in terms of you have to call it for rain. I just wanted to put it out there. That was like the only big issue I had the first year with the beer garden because I'm like, I don't know. I don't have anything to do with it. So anyway, so yeah. I wish you luck. We would, at the Historical Society, we would not be able to uh, go to a Sunday just because of the, um, pro the guide program that we have on Sundays. Um, so the Historical Society has a website and I would think that we could arrange to take advantage of that in terms of announcing if it was canceled. Okay, I'll leave that with um, uh, Mrs. Cr Ms. Kramer, Patsy, and, and, and maybe just double check with the Journey Heim where what your organization is, if somehow it involves alcohol. I'll let you follow that up with Doug. I'm just being overly paranoid, that's all. Okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mrs. Mahan. And I, I also support Mr. Hurd's motion. Thank you, Mr. Burke, for, for your interest. And thank you, Mrs. Kramer, for um, finding the space with the uh, Historical Society. And hopefully we have nice weather in, in September. So um, on a motion, this again is on two items. One is the town day round, the other is uh, the Jason Russell House for Saturdays in September. On a motion by Mr. Hurd, seconded by Mr. Diggins, Attorney Heim. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Helmuth? Yes. Miss, uh, Mrs. Mahan? Yes. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. It's a 5 0 vote. Great. Best of luck, Mr. Burke. Great. Good. Thank you. Thank I you hope, very much. I hope I see most of you there. It'd be great to meet you. Wish you great. good weather. <laughs> All right. Great. Thank Love you me. very much. Bye -bye. You too. Okay, so that is items 12 and 15. Item 16 is a request for on, on street overnight parking waiver, Adler Sioux, 106 Paul Revere Road. Adler is here if you'd like me to promote them. Yes. Okay. Good evening, Mr. Sue. Good evening. Thank you for having me. Good evening. Yeah, and before you start, I, I apologize for the late hour. That <laughs> it's uh, a few things ran late, and uh, the the best intentions was to to have you on about an hour ago. So I uh, apologize for that. But if you could tell us about the application and um, the circumstances at Paul Revere Road. No worries, certainly. So, um, so I, I I spoke with the the board and. 2013 and uh, at the time um you know is just after we had our first child and um i um you know the case of the bike property is that we have a single car garage here that really uh, um only holds us <laughs> compact car um and you know and since then um you know we our family has grown and you know job situation has changed um and and so um, in order to be able to get to uh, work for both myself and my wife and be able to, as well as do um, various pickups and drop-offs for the children, um, you know, we, we needed to get a second car. And so that, that's the reason for the request. Okay, and I'm gonna turn it to the board. Just, just for clarification, right now you have one parking waiver, is that correct? I do not have any parking waiver. Oh, you don't have any? Okay, I'm sorry, all right. Um, all right. Well, I will turn it to, and you have a single car garage and that's where your, your car is parked right now, um, on, on, on the Paul Revere side of the property. That's correct. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, all right. I will turn it to the board. Uh, Mr. Diggins. I'm all confused, you know, it's cause I thought, I mean, when I was reading the, the, um, the packet, I, mean, I thought he, I guess we, you were asked to come back if you, I'm sorry, do you, Mr. Chair, you were asked to come back once you got a second car? Or That's correct. Car? Yes, when we got, and when we 
got a second car. I was asked to um, come back and to speak with you guys. And and so it, it, the packet kind of led me to to feel that you were almost like not guaranteed, but that that we were going to approve it. You know, and I guess I'm trying to understand the why it is that the the passport didn't just say no um, at the beginning um, in order to be consistent. I see a hand raising over over there. I mean, and so so um, so maybe I'm, I'm going to stop here and then ask the chair if maybe he, he would be willing to let uh, my colleague respond and maybe help me out here uh, in understanding this. Yeah, no, that, I think that 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 makes good sense. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll call on Mrs. Mahan. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, going by my institutional memory, uh, when we had this hearing, uh, it was pointed out that there was a garage. Um, they had one car. We asked Mr. Sue if, if that car, um, we normally don't grant requests if there is a garage. And this is my memory. I can be corrected if I'm wrong. Um, and then the question was posed to the then board um, by Mr. Sue that um, he could certainly put one car in the garage, but he anticipated possibly getting a second. So if he could get his one overnight parking permit on Paul Rivera Road, because I think we had other people that came in that night we gave. And um, what he was told is, um, we can't give you permission for a request that hasn't been purchased and registered and has a license plate. And that if and when he does that, and I think we were given the sense that that might happen in the next few months. Um, that's when I told him, when you get that vehicle and it's properly registered, you can come back to the board. It was represented to us that it might be in the next month or two. And I said, then I'll put you on that next month agenda and fast forward for whatever I guess happened in his circumstances, they, they've been using one car and I haven't spoken to Mr. So, um, and that second car he anticipated purchasing within a couple of months in 2013, he's just now doing in 2021. Is that right, Mr. So? Well, I, I mean, I, I guess, yeah, well, my recollection of the conversation was, you know, we had discussed, you know, the one, the, you know, the, you know, possibly growing the family at the time. And, and, you know, clearly that, that didn't happen right then. And, and so we were, um, uh, you know, we, we made do, we've made do for the past, you know, several years with one car. Um, so and is, um, is that in the garage or so you do not have one over any overnight parking waiver to park on Paul Rivera? That that's correct. There, I, I do not currently have any overnight parking on or on on Paul Rivera right now. Okay. And I guess just to to close this out, um, when this language was written, it was with the anticipation that he would be coming in in the next month or two, which is why I said I'm 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 going to ask this to be tabled. And put it on for the next month. So I, I, I um, so um, Mr. Chair, uh, through you to Ms. Um, Ms. Mahan. Oh, uh, oh, hang on one second, Mr. Diggins. Sure. Did you want to say anything further, Mrs. Mahan, or is that? Um, what it was was approval pending the uh, anticipated purchase of a new vehicle. Um, Mr. Sue was asked to resubmit its petition. When he purchases another vehicle, as soon as it's purchased, it would be included um, on the agenda for the next selectman's meeting. So what that means, that doesn't mean, what it means is we couldn't evaluate your response. We have been giving them to um, people on Paul Rivera Road, but that was just a vote of the board that was saying you were seeking you know, conditional approval for that one spot in front of your house. Um, anticipating you might need that. And what the board voted was, if and when you do purchase that vehicle, you need to come back. Um, and I guess the only part that's missing here is um, we're doing an agenda item based on the 2013 um, agenda minutes versus, um, I mean, I have, no, I have no problem doing that as long as, um, I guess it took them nine years, which is fine, or 10 years to come in for it. 
But I can tell you the board anticipated that this second vehicle purchase was gonna happen in a day or two. So what we haven't done is sent this to the traffic unit just to verify that um, the one car's in the garage and the other space is empty. So uh, I don't know what my colleagues wanna do on this. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Mahan. I'm gonna to return to Mr. Diggins and then hear from Mr. Hurd and Mr. Helmuth. Well, until we, we do our big parking review, you know, or get this committee of, of, of uh, the select board on parking up and get something out of it, it, my goal is to be as consistent as possible with past practices. I mean, so it seems like we have given um, these parking waivers on Paul Revere Road, and in that we were going to do it in this situation, you know, uh, or at least we were, it seemed like we were leaning strongly towards doing that because it seems like in that meeting we did some waivers. So, so with that, I am going to motion to approve the waiver. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. Uh, Mr. Hurd. Yeah, so I would just say from the outset, absent what happened in the previous meeting, this if this application came before us just standalone, then we probably would not approve it just because we've had a number of these applications before us recently. And always the first question is, do you have off street parking, which they do. Um, I certainly will rely on Mrs. Mahan's memory of the meeting as the only board member that was at that meeting that currently still serves just going strictly off the meeting minutes, I think there is at least some sort of a reasonable reliance standard that the applicant could look at the meeting minutes and supplement that with his own memory and say there was a conditional approval pending the return and when they purchased the car. And I think Mrs. Mahan is correct that for the board to have approved that at the time, there would be an anticipation that that approval would only last a few months. But if the applicant purchased a new vehicle with a reliance on the fact that he, ha he had this conditional approval to the, to that would allow him to park the car, um, I would tend to support Mr. Dagan's motion. Okay, thank you, Mr. Hurd. Uh, and I'll take that as a second. Is, is that a second? Yeah, that's a second. Okay. And again, I, it's sorry to keep going, but, and I say that just as a qualification that general, that this doesn't change our policy as to issuing overnight parking permits if there's off street parking. This is it's just specific to this one application, is why I would be inclined to support Mr. Diggins' motion in second. Okay, thank you, Mr. Hurd. Mr. Helmuth. Thank you. Um, for my benefit, because I'm a new member of the board, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, could could you or, or um, another member kind of brief me quickly on what our precedent has been on Paul Revere? I mean, I know the street well and that there's no driveway to speak of on these properties. Um, when we've given off street permits before, have we done so for a second car with, you know, in situations where one car could be in the garage, but not a second? I, I can answer. We may have to get you answers on all of the circumstances there later. My understanding is from Mr. Sue's house down to Mass Ave, several of the homes don't have any driveways. You may have in a couple of those may even be multifamily yeah. homes. So there might be more than one waiver. I'm not aware of any where there is garage parking that the waiver has been granted. Um, but but clearly between his house and Mass Ave, there are a number of waivers that have been granted. Perhaps for other reasons. Yeah. Um, I'm going to support Mr. Diggins' motion. I think for the reasons that Mr. Hurd articulated in this case, I think it, you know, I, I, I'm not... I think it's great that that the applicant went a few years just serving on one car. You know that's that's kind of um, that's that's admirable. Um, I don't feel like that they that he should be penalized for that. And I'm, no one's suggesting that at all. But because I understand that you know 
the expectation of, of, of the board's prior conditional approval would have been much more time limited. So I get that, but I think, you know, still, I, I feel like with Mr. Hurd, I think there's, there's a reasonable um, case to be made for what could be an exception to our general precedent. Thank you, Mr. Helmuth. And I, I will also support on the limited basis that Mr. Hurd outlined. I, I think had Mr. Sufzi, you were here for the first time this evening um, with, without the precedent back in 2013, I couldn't support the additional car, but given the minutes from that meeting and your collective recollection with Mrs. Mahan, I, I view this as an exception that I could go along with and, and given your reliance on that vote of the board back in 2013. But to, to Mr. Hurd's point, I think we need to stress that that, that really truly is an exception based on those unique circumstances that happened that evening. So um, with a motion by Mr. Diggins, seconded by Mr. Hurd for approval, Attorney Heim. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Helmet. Yes. Mrs. Mahan. Yes. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. It's an unanimous vote. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sue, for um, for your patience this evening. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, so just for, for board members, I, I unfortunately we didn't hit the 11 o'clock target. There's a couple of items here. We are going to put off the opera presentation. Mr. Cheptonley may have a, a brief request on that. On the remote participation study committee, I don't expect to anticipate a long discussion on that if the board is inclined to, to, to vote on that. But I, I'd like to ask for um, extension of the board's 11 o'clock rule. Um, and I did bear in mind, we do still have an executive session after this, but for our public session, I don't think we will need more than five more minutes, uh, seven at the outside. So moved. Um, so if there's a motion, okay, thank you, Mr. Hurd. Is there a second? Second. Okay, so uh, move. why don't we say to 1115 um, on the public session? Uh, I believe we need a vote for that, Attorney Heim. Well, Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Diggins? I am an hour away from home and I gotta get home by tea. So just keep that in mind. So it's not simply a matter of my like wanting to go along. I gotta get home at some point. So yes. Um, Mr. Helmuth? Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Yes. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Item 19 is a vote on the remote participation study committee. This was a committee that was created at town meeting earlier this year um, when we had the discussions about coming back into the chambers. Mr. Helmuth had uh, done quite a bit of work on the select board. So I will put it out to the board for perhaps a statement of interest or, or a nomination. Mr. Chair? Yes, Mr. Helmuth. I would be happy to serve. Okay. I nominate Thank you. Mr. Helmuth. Okay. Okay. Um, do we have a second? Okay. All right. On uh, Mr. Diggins, any comment? No, I'll fine. Okay. <laughs> All right. So on a motion by Mr. Hurd, seconded by Mrs. Mahan, Attorney Hahn. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Helmuth. Yes. Mrs. Mahan. Yes. Mr. Corsi. Yes. It's unanimous vote. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Helmuth. Um, all right, <laughs> item 20, uh, Mr. Chapdelaine, I believe we're gonna put the funding presentation off to the next meeting, but there was, was there a request that you wanted to make tonight for some of the limited items in that? Correct, um, and if, if I may, Mr. Chair, I wanted to briefly say, uh, we do wanna kick off public feedback on the expenditure of these funds. So what I will do is film a presentation that I otherwise would have given tonight release that this week, and then open up a public survey later this week um, until the second or first week of September, then come back to the board on September 13th to present uh, the framework that will have been presented in the video with some updates updates based on what, um, what was received from the public, and then come back at the board's meeting at the end of September, which I think falls on the 27th, and hopefully request final endorsement for the framework and some set of expenditures. Uh, that said, tonight, what I would like to ask the board for positive consideration on are three discrete items. One, a vote to formally accept these funds. Um, that's the actual, the primary action the board needs to take to then authorize um, further expenditures, just like really any federal grant. 
the town would receive, then I would ask for your endorsement of two immediate expenditures, even while we go through this public vetting process. One, an approval of up to $1.6 million being expended for water and sewer investments. Um, I put in the memo for current needs. This would be specifically uh, utilized for the meter replacement program that I think most of the board is likely aware of that stems from the current meter system no longer being supported by the vendor that we are pursuing via town council. Um, and then a second discrete item of a $50,000 award to the Housing Corporation of Arlington so that they can fund a portion of their homelessness prevention program and actually make awards to qualified people in need of that aid. Um, so if, if the board would consider action on those, I would then follow through on the other steps I mentioned in terms of uh, videotaping a presentation. Video, I just aged myself saying videotaping, recording a presentation, uh, issuing that and kicking off this public process. Thank you, Mr. Chapterlain. I will turn it to the board. Uh, Mr. Helmuth. Thank you. I would like to make a motion uh, to support each of the town manager's requests. Great. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Hurd. I just had an image in my mind of you putting the videotape in there, those old, just like Christmas morning, 91. Um, I'd be happy to second that request and look forward to the more expanded dis discussion. Uh, Mr. Diggins. Uh, uh, questions, but no questions. Thanks. <laughs> okay, uh, Mrs. Mahan. Um, I would certainly like this on the next board agenda. Um, I, I'm, I, in light of, we have to get our colleague, Mr. Diggins home safely um, sooner rather than later, but I really was dismayed that um, when the president released this federal funding, he stated top three um, areas where it could go to. And of the top three was to uh, pay a fair and equitable uh, li living wage to our first responders, police, fire, public works. And um, when you made your statement to the advocate, uh, granted there are 10 different categories you can spend this on, you only mentioned nine and you left that out. Um, and I really feel one of the thrusts of opera is to address that um, justifiable expense. And I don't see anything about involving the unions in any of this process. Um, and I certainly wanna be involved in it as a member of the board. I'm not gonna go into it now, but I, I have what other city and town managers have done with um, opera funding in terms of um, what they've been offering to the unions. Uh, Winchester offered 20% over four years, but I'll stop there. I'm, I'm just really dismayed, but in, in light of the hour, that's fine. I'm willing to go along with um, what the manager um, has suggested. And I do wanna make a statement to all the town union employees. Um, and I can tell you, I don't consider this free money. If I did consider it free money, I certainly would not make the statement that the town does not spend free money on the unions. So I'll leave it at that. Okay, thank, thank you, Mrs. Mahan. I, I'll, I'll support the motions as well. And I, I do want to point it to the board. The manager and I had spoken about this agenda item because we had so much on, we agreed that if we ran out of time, he would make the presentation afterwards. So it really was at my request, not that he is putting off this discussion um, because we, we just had so much before us earlier this evening. And there were some things that took longer than others, but we will put that on the next agenda. The manager will put together his presentation and we'll give this more time at the next meeting. So with a, a motion, um, I believe by Mr. Helmuth, seconded by Mr. Hurd, uh, Attorney Hine. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Helmuth. Yes. Mrs. Mahan. Yes. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. It's a unanimous vote. Okay, and uh, items 21 through 24 is Move correspondence. It. Received, I hear a motion from Mrs. Mahan for um, receipt second. and a second by Mr. Hurd. Anybody with any questions or comments? Okay. I would just Mr. ask the, the chair and the town manager to, just to go over these tomorrow, the next day. And if they need to be sent to either the manager or another department, that would be great. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Attorney Heim. Uh, Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Helmuth. Yes. Mrs. Mahan. Yes. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. 
Unanimous vote. Okay. Uh, new business, Attorney Heim? No new business. Mr. Chapterline? I will pass on new business tonight. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Helmer? No new business. Mr. Diggins? I'm going to pass too. I got some, but not later, not the time. Okay. Uh, Mr. Hurd? My only thing is that I'm going to follow up with Mr. Diggins tomorrow so he can explain to me what's over his shoulder. I've been looking at it all night. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Mahan? Uh, my new business is if Attorney Hine could uh, call me tomorrow anytime between 8 and 10 or after 2. I just have a question about open meeting law preamble. You bet. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Mahan. I, I don't have any new business given the hour. So uh, I will take a motion to adjourn. We do have an executive session on here. So the motion, we will not be coming back to public session. To, um, do I have a motion for that? Um, and if I could, Mr. Chair, I'd like to take a motion that the board um, suspend and go and reconvene an executive session. Um, and um, when we come out of executive session, it will be solely for the purposes to adjourn the meeting. Is that correct, Attorney Heim? With no votes expected outside if I, of. If I may just add that the, the two purposes we're going into executive session, if, 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 if uh, Ms. Mon will take a friendly uh, yes. sort of suggestion, is that one, to um, approve uh, executive session minutes and examine their appropriateness for relief, those listed on the agenda. And number two, uh, to discuss the open meeting law completed, Mr. Christopher Loretti. And, and that's acceptable, uh, Mrs. Mahan? Yes, thank you. Okay, do we have a second? I'll second that with the request, Mrs. Mahan, if we can, I believe we can adjourn from executive session just for the benefit of ACMI. Okay. Great, okay. Um, Mr. Helmuth or Mr. Diggins, any comments, questions? Comments. Okay. So on a motion by Mrs. Mahan, seconded by Mr. Hurd, Attorney Hahn. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Helmet. Yes. Ms. Mahan. Yes. Mr. Corsi. Yes. Mr. Okay. Nunez vote. Thank you very much. That ends the public component of the meeting tonight. Thank you uh, very much to the members of the board and to the public.